Well, welcome everyone. We're looking at, we're starting our conference on the automotive globalization and the pandemic. How will new trade relations and the global pandemic affect the globalization of the auto industry? We have a, so, well, we should also turn off, I should also, I should also mute my, my live stream. And you have to get to YouTube so you can, um, you can make, don't forget to mute your YouTube when you do this. <laughs> All right, everybody, here we go again. Welcome everyone uh, to the conference. How will tr new trade relations and the global pandemic affect the globalization of the auto industry? Uh, we have some great speakers with us today to talk about this topic. Um, I'm gonna start off by talking about uh, a little bit about the Automotive Futures Group and set the stage for our first speaker, uh, Alan Deardorff from the University of Michigan. We should get to the right should get to the right screen. It always helps if you get to the right screen. Here we go. Okay. So, Automotive Futures Group. Uh, I'm the, my, I, my name is Bruce Belzowski. I'm the managing director of the Automotive Futures Group. Uh, we've been doing the conferences now for going on our 13th year. This is our, I think, our 56th conference. Uh, we'll be, uh, we get our uh, funding uh, for our research from our affiliate program. Uh, we got supporting members and research partners, and we focus on globalization, advanced powertrains, and uh, intelligent transportation systems, and well, as well as doing five uh, annual conferences. Um, here's a list of our affiliate members. Uh, we appreciate all the support they give to us. If, if they were not doing this, we could not be putting on these conferences. We thank them very much. Uh, we are research partners come from our IT organizations, OEMs, uh, government uh, NGOs, as well as uh, suppliers and consultants. Uh, when you look at the major projects that we're working on for 2020, our powertrain strategies for 21st century, our new survey is going out this uh, in May, and we'll have the results for our, in our conference in July. Our China New Energy Vehicle Project, uh, is a continuing project that we've been working on for the last three or four years. Um, we're also looking at the effects of autonomous vehicles on the economy, society, and the individual. Um, when we start off, started off 2020, we came up with some major research questions that we'd be looking at. And so much of this has changed within the last couple of months. Uh, when you look at how our auto manufacturers uh, and suppliers are making themselves into mobility companies, well, you see something like GM with Maven uh, shutting down the program. This is something that we've seen uh, when you have major changes in the industry, something as drastic as a pandemic, you see things change. Uh, the other mobility one was how successful private partnerships, public private partnerships will be in mobility as a service. Uh, in powertrains, what's the tipping point for EVs? Uh, and this is, uh, we saw what happened just recently, I think it was yesterday when Ford, uh, 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 they didn't cancel the project with, for the Ford F-150 with uh, Rivian, but I think they put it on hold. Uh, this is something that manufacturers do when things are, when money is tight, they go back to what they do the best. Um, in terms of powertrains, is the dealership network prepared for mass EV sales and service? Uh, and power, also in powertrains, can OEMs use hybrids as a transitionary uh, technology to EVs or can they develop ICE vehicles that meet regulations until EV technology and infrastructure matures? Uh, we'll see, we see something like this playing out with the uh, changes that, are that have already taken place within the uh, 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 within the government in terms of the cafe regulations. And in terms of globalization, how long will it take manufacturers and suppliers to reconfigure their supply chains to meet the new NAFTA regulations, the USMCA regulations? Now, this is something that we're uh, 
uh, we'll be talking about today. Uh, also, how much influence will China and the EU have, uh, have on the acceleration of EV sales in the US? Uh, well, again, this is something that's probably is gonna be on hold for a little bit uh, while we deal with the pandemic. Uh, for our researchers at Automotive Futures, we have uh, Kara Elkire, who's uh, online with us today. She's managing the Q&A session with us. Um, uh, Wee Jen Lee has uh, worked with us on the conferences. Some of the uh, data that I'll show you today is, is based on work that she's done. Uh, Rishi Chen and Aaron Melvaney have been working on our, uh, the China and global automotive electric vehicle industry uh, project. Uh, Minori Suzuki is working on the autonomous vehicle project. Uh, Aaron Dahl is working on a U of M industry uh, student survey. We have two, uh, two, draw, uh, two uh, uh, ways uh, that we've looked at that, one in 2013, one 2017. Uh, Daniel Nemertz working on the powertrain strategy survey. And Alex Bald uh, has been working on the uh, U of M uh, industry student survey, putting it into a Power BI, a business intelligence uh, uh, format that we have on our web website that you can see in automotivefutures.org. Uh, we also got a, a U of M School Alliance Consulting Group. This is a, uh, uh, a, a pro bono group that helps uh, companies uh, work on different projects. Uh, this year, we've had this uh, business school group working help working with us on develop, uh, developing our affiliate program as also, as well as improving our conferences. And to that end, they've created a conference uh, review. And there's a link that was sent to all of you about this uh, that we ask that you send after the conference. Also, we've created a new LinkedIn page for uh, making uh, links within the universe, uh, university, within the university as well as the industry as, and to uh, try to get more things out in a more timely manner. Uh, conference is coming up. We got powertrain coming up in July. Uh, uh, Future of Automotive IT in September. That's our 12th annual and our 13th annual Inside China conference coming up in November. We're not sure which one of how many of these are going to be virtual, but uh, we will see. Uh, so today we've got uh, uh, Alan Deardorff, who's a professor, uh, an economics professor, who's joining us uh, to talk about uh, his view on the globalization. Uh, overall and uh, looking at issues of globalization and the effects of the pandemic on the globalization. Uh, Jack uh, Coporo from uh, the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, he's gonna be talking about work that they have done on the USMCA as well as some of the, uh, the uh, global trade issues that he's been following. Then we'll take about a 10 minute break and come back with uh, Christian Dizek from, uh, from the Center for Automotive Research uh, she's done a lot of work, and in, in especially in the USMCA, uh, as well as labor issues and economics uh, at, at the Center for Automotive Research. And uh, Joe uh, Zajek from uh, the uh, Original Equipment Supplier Association, OESA, which is the representative for, uh, for all the automotive suppliers uh, that are part of their group. Uh, and they've been pretty busy at, uh, working with the administration. Uh, Making, making changes and, and making suggestions about how to, how to open up the industry. Uh, at the end of the conference, everybody will get a link to all the PDF presentations as well uh, as links to the uh, video presentations. Affiliates get the presentations, but they'll also get a summary uh, overview and highlights of the conference. Uh, any, any of the agenda, speaker bios, registration lists, sponsorship opportunities, affiliate information, upcoming events, all the things that are always, that we have in our in-person uh, uh, conferences. Uh, we will be having uh, on our website and we sent the link to the website on the, on the live stream link that everybody just received. Uh, audience questions, again, on the uh, email that we sent you, there's a link to the uh, Google form for ask questions for during the conference. So please uh, avail yourself of that. Uh, so when we look at the, uh, the trade agreements that have been made uh, recently, we look at uh, USMCA, US China, uh, US Korea, US EU, and also uh, other countries have not been quiet in terms of dealing with trade. EU and Canada, EU, Japan, and, as the, and also the, the, uh, the new comprehensive uh, 
uh, progressive trans-Pacific uh, partnership. Uh, when you look at what's happening with USMCA, um, the final version or revised version was uh, signed in, in December of last year. Uh, again, of course, it, re, it, it uh, replaces the, uh, the AFNA, NAFTA that took place and uh, went into effect in 1994. Um, currently, the, the tariffs, uh, the, the previous and NAFTA tariffs were uh, exempt for if 62.5% if of vehicles are made in Canada, Mexico, or the US, that jumps to 75%. Uh, Mexico also auto industry is right now trying to seek a delay of the uh, of the content rules and hopefully uh, uh, Joe might be able to shed, uh, shed some light on that with the with the from the OASA uh, perspective uh, there uh, Mexico is seeking uh, to start at the beginning of 2021 but right now the administration has pushed it just to uh, July 1st um, the um, Boston Consulting Group came up with a, a little graphic here to look at to show how things have changed from uh, NAFTA to USMCA. Uh, and the, the big issue here and uh, something our speakers will be talking about is the um, uh, labor value content, which is the, something that's a little more challenging uh, to talk about, which is why I'm going to leave it for them. Um, we got a little bit on this. Uh, we're looking at how the the US Customs and Border Protection is gonna be dealing with this. Uh, as, but we're also looking at what US is doing with China. Where they've completed the uh, phase one deal, which is uh, signed in January. It, uh, it, uh, China will be uh, buying more stuff from us in terms of manufacturing purchases, uh, farm products and services. That includes uh, via, uh, motor vehicles, industry machinery, a lot of things that having to do with the auto industry. And from the US side, they'll cut by half the tariff rated imposed in September on $120 billion list of, of uh, Chinese goods to 7.5%. And the tariffs that were scheduled to go in effect in December on nearly $160 billion worth of Chinese goods uh, were suspended indefinitely. Uh, for phase two negotiation, US says, says that 25% on the tariffs on 25% of $250 million billion dollars worth of Chinese goods put in place earlier will remain immediately unchanged. These could be rolled back as part of phase two negotiation. For the US-Korea free trade agreement, uh, which went into effect in 2012, uh, this is not new. It's been, done, it's, as I said, it's been, been, been going on since 2012, but the new version removes a few regulatory burdens for US automakers to export cars. It extends 25% uh, US tariff on uh, imported Korean trucks. Uh, it lifts a cap on US car exports to South Korea that don't need to meet Korean safety standards, something that the Koreans and the Japanese have used to keep uh, US vehicles out uh, of their country for many, 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 many years. Uh, in terms of standards, the US also agreed to ex exempt South Korea from a uh, new 25% tariff on global steel. Uh, instead, uh, South Korea accepted a quota to limit steel exports to the United States to 75% of what they were selling before. And also the uh, six year old trade deal has allowed both countries to sell more than $60 billion in cars, machinery and goods and uh, to each other with few restrictions, making South Korea America's sixth largest trading partner. With the EU, uh, it's a little different story, not as, uh, Things have not been uh, as, as uh, easy to do in terms of uh, trade. Um, the, uh, the EU has their own uh, issues that they want to work on. Uh, in 20, there's been a lot of trade tension since 2018 between the US uh, and the EU. Uh, US imposed 25% and 10% on steel and aluminum respectively on imported uh, EU uh, steel on the basis of national security concerns and the EU has retaliated. Uh, EU officials have said it would retaliate if Washington makes good on its threat to raise car tariffs. Um, so auto related uh, trade currently accounts for 8% of total trade in goods between the EU and US. And the US is the fourth largest biggest exporter of cars to the European Union. 19% of the total value of US car exports heads for the EU, uh, representing 12% of, of EU imports of values. So there's something 
the EU has something to talk about as well as the US when it comes to these negotiations. And the work that they were doing in the US also has a, has a play for, for the EU in, in talking to the US where uh, they, they uh, have made uh, 30 million, uh, 3 million uh, passenger cars in 2018 representing 25% of total US production. Now at the, e, at the US plants, uh, EU car makers provide jobs for 120,000 Americans and across the US. In Canada, the Canada and the EU made their own uh, 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 trade agreement in 2016 uh, after, the, after they saw that the US was going to uh, uh, go it alone in, in terms of doing their own trade. Uh, so the EU has, uh, uh, now allows uh, tar has tariffs on Canadian built, including uh, built vehicles, including 10% on automobiles. They'll be phased out over seven years. The EU uh, tariffs on 22% on light goods vehicles will be phased out over three years. 16% uh, on mini uh, buses uh, carrying at least 10 people will be phased out over five years. And agreement will eliminate the EU's 4.5% tariff on Canadian made auto parts, which is interesting because it depends on how, you, uh, how do you define something made in Canada uh, because many of the uh, uh, global auto manufacturers also have plants in Canada that they could export, use to export to the EU. Uh, and also uh, Canada will dismantle import duties at 6.1% for automobiles over a period of five to seven years. Uh, in the EU with Japan, uh, Japan has been very busy uh, uh, because once they realized that the US was going to go it alone, uh, they decided to make their own agreement. And they, in early 19, they did that with the EU where the Japan agreement will remove uh, EU tariffs on 10% on Japanese cars and 3% for uh, most car parts. Uh, it'll scrap Japanese duties on some 30% of EU cheese and 15% of wines, as well as open up access to public tenders in Japan. Uh, and finally, the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, the CPTPP, which was signed and it's a in a revised version of in 2019, and 11 countries uh, uh, signed this, all with uh, all with uh, coast along the Pacific uh, Ocean, and they all are uh, are uh, what one minister called a powerful signal against protectionism and trade wars. That's what the uh, this particular, this is an agreement that the US backed out of uh, uh, when the Trump administration started uh, and they have been, and the, the rest of the group decided to continue to do it. Well, the good news was that they, they were able to get, uh, uh, get together and it what they have done represents 13% of the global economy. Uh, but if the US had stayed in, it would have represented 40%. And the big goal for, for this was to uh, it, it, at the beginning was to try to uh, uh, help and uh, in some ways force uh, China to be a better global partner. Um, there's a variety of things that goes across the automotive industry uh, through the CPTPP. And uh, you can see the uh, with Canada and, but things phasing in and out uh, depending on what, the, your, what their country is doing. Uh, in terms of automotive, but it's usually uh, uh, phases out tariffs basically uh, across the uh, uh, across the Asia across Asia Pacific, as well as uh, Mexico and and uh, Canada are also involved in this. So you can see here the uh, tariff eliminations that go on, and it varies by how long it's going to take uh, by country and uh, and also uh, by what they're planning to do uh, in the near future. Um, so that's all I have to do to, to, to do is kind of set up uh, what was going on, what we'll be talking about today. As I say here, the links of the presentations and the videos will be emailed this weekend. Um, so let's go to our first speaker, Alan Deerdorf. Uh, Alan, I'm going to unmute you here. And I'm going to do a quick introduction for Alan. He's a professor of economics and public policy at the University of Michigan. I uh, received his PhD in economics from uh, Cornell University in 71 and has been on the faculty of the University of Michigan since 1970. He has served as a consultant on many government agencies, including the departments of state, treasury, and labor, 
of the United States government and international institutions, including the OECD and the World Bank. And he's published numerous articles on various aspects of international trade and theory, trade theory and policy. Now, Professor Deardorff's current research interests include potential implications of rules of origin in proliferating free trade agreements, the exemption of products from tariffs in FTAs, and the implications of recent trade policy changes and trade fric frictions between the United States and other countries. Professor Deardorff, thank you for joining us. Please take it away. Okay, <clears throat> well, thank you, Bruce. Uh, uh, I, I loved and, and, and learned a lot from your introduction. Uh, you got a lot of details about uh, all these different trade agreements uh, and what the tariffs and plans for uh, getting rid of them that I had not looked at. Uh, so that's good to have. I'm going to have to go back and, and keep your slides for future purposes. Uh, let me see if I can get this thing to, there we go. Okay. Uh, what I want to talk about is uh, intended to be pretty much background information for the, for the rest of the conference today uh, about uh, globalization somewhat generally, uh, recent trade policies uh, that have come into effect, some for autos, but, but uh, more generally as well. Uh, then a little bit on the effects of the pandemic as it seems to have been uh, playing out. And finally, uh, even littler bit about the prospects for the future uh, of, of trade policy. Uh, the first thing I'll, I'll mention here is that, and, and this is, was a bit of a surprise, and of course it didn't mean very much, but back in 2018, our president actually uh, argued in favor uh, of getting rid of all tariffs and barriers and subsidies. Uh, the EU was coming to visit and he was saying, let's get rid of everything. Uh, did he mean it? I don't know, but he certainly didn't follow up on that by doing it. Uh, instead, of course, what we saw was uh, multiple rounds of tariffs on various things. And, and Bruce has already mentioned some of these. Uh, the, the first uh, significant uh, one and, and quite a change from what had come uh, previously was the tariffs that he put on, uh, on steel and aluminum. 25% uh, tariffs on steel from just about every country initially, 10% uh, tariffs on aluminum. Uh, these were put on with the justification of national security, uh, though nobody could make a reasonable case for why tariffs on steel and aluminum from our allies uh, should play any role in national security. Of course, this is extremely relevant for the auto industry because it uses as an input lots of steel and uh, especially, and, and also aluminum. Uh, and the effect of these tariffs, although Trump might have uh, not, not accepted that it would be this effect, but it was to raise, raise prices uh, of steel and aluminum. Uh, most of those tariffs are still in place on an awful lot of countries uh, and continue to be quite relevant, although we've uh, removed them now on uh, several countries. Bruce mentioned that uh, we got rid of them on Korea uh, in return for their limiting their exports. Uh, they also were gotten rid of uh, for Canada and Mexico, not actually as part of uh, the renegotiated NAFTA, but as uh, an inducement, I guess, uh, for it to go through. The second thing that happened, of course, was the trade war with China. Uh, we put multiple rounds of tariffs on more and more products from China, and every time we did it, they responded on the same day with tariffs on our exports. That continued for several rounds all through 2018 and into 2019, uh, reaching eventually that phase one agreement, which has been said to be a pause in it uh, or a truce in it, uh, but it, it, I would say it wasn't really. Uh, we, we, we only gave two things to China in return for that, and Bruce mentioned them both. Uh, one was cutting a few of our tariffs in half, a few of the new tariffs we had put on in half, and the second was to simply not raise tariffs on even more products uh, as we had threatened to do. So, so it didn't by any means uh, end the trade war with China that is still very much uh, in place. Uh, Trump threatened car uh, tariffs on automobiles from everybody, everybody, again, on national security grounds, even though, again, that doesn't make much sense. Uh, that is still pending. He's got the authorization to do it from his own uh, offices that did a, a, a report on it. Uh, and I haven't heard much about it lately, uh, but as far as I know, uh, he still views it, that as something that he could go ahead and do. And if he did it, uh, others 
Europeans certainly, but others as well would, would retaliate. An interesting thing that he did, not terribly relevant, well, yeah, actually it is relevant for autos, uh, is it was very brief. Uh, it, late last year, he threatened to put tariffs uh, on all exports from Mexico. Uh, and I think the idea was it would be 5% uh, on all exports, but then if they didn't do anything, it would rise to 10% after one month and so forth. Um, and he threatened that, uh, if, that he would do that if they didn't uh, take action to stop the migration from Central America through Mexico into the United States. Uh, and after just a few days, Mexico did make such a promise and in fact uh, did change their policies in some ways. Uh, and so he, he didn't do that. Uh, it was an interesting example of the uh, technique that President Trump seems to be using, certainly in trade policy and maybe in other areas, of threatening harm to others and to ourselves, although he is less likely to recognize the harm to ourselves, uh, to try to get them to change their policies, to change their behavior. With Mexico, uh, it seems to have worked. Uh, with Europe, uh, I don't think it has worked. With China, uh, not really. Uh, they promised to to send a, to buy more of our exports of things, uh, so I go, suppose you could say that it worked a little bit. But that seems to be uh, the the way he is running trade policy. Uh, finally, I, I would mention that there are tariffs uh, on the European Union. Uh, this is a much more limited thing, but it, and it was in retaliation for uh, the subsidies the EU applies to the Airbus company. Uh, the U.S. has been found to provide subsidies to Boeing. Uh, that that uh, case is a little bit behind the other one, and so uh, tariffs have not yet been put in place on the U.S. Uh, because of that. Uh, I should probably say that although this has happened under Trump, uh, this is the sort of thing that might well have happened under previous presidents as well. It was uh, consistent uh, with the negotiations and rulings of the World Trade Organization. Uh, here's uh, one picture of the trade war with China. Uh, well, with, with U.S. tariffs in general, actually, it's showing uh, down here at the very bottom uh, the, the tariffs we put on solar panels and washing machines. Those The tariffs themselves were big, but the amount of trade that was covered was, was very small. Uh, then there's the steel and aluminum tariffs, which were much more significant in terms of the amount of trade. And then time after time after time, we put tariffs on, uh, on China. Uh, Let's see, other things that has, have happened, uh, most of these were touched on by, uh, and actually explained quite well by Bruce, uh, the amendment of the chorus of the uh, trade agreement with Korea, uh, which did a few things, one of which I mentioned here is the extension of our 25% tariffs on light trucks. Uh, the renegotiation of NAFTA, again, he mentioned that that's going to do two main things. Uh, it's going to require greater North American content in autos in order to qualify for exemption from tariffs when products cross the borders. And the second is a minimum value added. Uh, he alluded to this, said we'd explain it more. Uh, I'm not sure I can explain it too much more, but it was an, a new provision that has never showed up in any trade agreement previously, uh, that in order to qualify for zero tariffs crossing the borders, uh, the products in the auto sector needed to have a minimum percentage of value added put into them by labor earning more than $16 an hour. No labor in Mexico is ever going to earn that much. So that clearly is requiring greater labor input uh, from the US and, and Canada. Exactly how that can ever be enforced or even known, I think, is not terribly clear. But some of the other speakers may have something to say about that. Uh, I mentioned just a couple of other things on this slide. Uh, the next one is perhaps not relevant uh, to the auto industry, but we've been doing a war the US has with a particular company in China, the Huawei company that makes the most advanced 5G telecoms technologies. Uh, and uh, we have various reasons for doing that. It doesn't seem to be hurting them all that much. Uh, it probably is going to hurt the United States because uh, we're going to have to rely on uh, less advanced technologies uh, for the new 5G telecoms if we don't buy from Huawei because they are the leader uh, in this. And then finally, I have to mention that Trump has taken actions to block appointments to what's called the dispute settlement appellate body uh, at the World Trade Organization. 
And uh, as of December of 2019, uh, he had blocked enough of those appointments uh, that that body no longer has a quorum and it is not able to fi do finalize any, any processes uh, in the WTO. So the WTO has a, a very important part of it has simply been killed or put into a coma. It's unable to function uh, until something changes on that. Whether that's going to be relevant for the auto industry, I'm not sure, but it certainly is relevant uh, in, in other areas. Uh, trade actions by others, well, of course, lots of trade agreements, uh, Bruce mentioned, and that's important. Uh, but the main thing relevant to us most directly is that they have responded uh, with retaliatory tariffs uh, by many countries, and we basically had a trade war leading to that phase one truce that I mentioned, but that doesn't mean, I think, a great deal. Uh, here is a chart showing the, the retaliatory tariffs uh, that have been put on by not just China, but other countries. Uh, you notice, compared to the previous chart that the thing doesn't go up as far, uh, that's because we don't export nearly as much as we import. So uh, when they put tariffs on, they're not putting it on as much trade as we can put it on when we put tariffs uh, on imports. Here's a chart showing what the tariffs did in both directions with China. And basically, uh, they went up. And now, uh, as of the end of this graph anyway, uh, the increases had reached about the same, same level. Turning now to the effects of the pandemic, uh, and I may be going faster than I had expected to, um, there have been all sorts of effects, and I've listed a bunch of them there, and I will have a few things to say uh, about uh, each of them, I think. Uh, but not a lot to say. Uh, much of this, of course, isn't directly relevant to the auto industry, but uh, it's going to have indirect effects, I'm quite sure. Uh, on travel, this is something that as a train economist, even though I uh, have participated in it by traveling myself a great deal, uh, I've never paid that much attention to it as a form of international trade. Uh, but my goodness, of course, it has plummeted. Uh, here's a chart showing the number of people going through the TSA checkpoints in March of this year and March of the previous year. And of course, it's uh, gone down close to zero. So a huge effect uh, on, on travel. And that's had adverse effects, of course, on the stock prices of the airlines, uh, which uh, this just shows, I think, all the uh, various American airlines and how much their stock prices went down. Uh, I've noticed, as I'm sure many here have, stock prices have been going up uh, since this chart ended, since the uh, well, I don't know, over the last month or so. Uh, they haven't gotten back to their original levels, but I think if this chart had gone further in time, uh, it would show some, some pickup. Stock markets generally, again, declined, although I think they have been coming back up again, but not back to their original levels. And this is not just in the United States. Uh, this shows a bunch of different countries uh, where stock prices have, uh, have gone down from February to March uh, of, of this year. Much more important for the auto industry, of course, I mean, stock prices are important too, but uh, is factories have been shut down. Uh, and here is a chart that I found in Automotive News. It's a, more than a month old. Uh, this was showing, uh, I think actually, maybe it is not a month old, uh, although that's what I said I got the source from. Uh, it shows the states where assembly plants had been closed as of April, Oh, I'm sorry, no, as of March 25th. And then they were reporting when they plan to restart. Uh, and as of that date, uh, Ford G and GM had no plans uh, to reopen any of their US assembly plants. Uh, Fiat Chrysler had said they would reopen them sometime after May 3rd, but they didn't say when. For other companies, uh, that was not the case. Already they were talking about when they would open up. Uh, and in fact, there was one plant, I've forgotten now which uh, company it was, but it was uh, European, I believe. Uh, well, maybe not. Anyway, a plant in Georgia uh, opened up in, uh, on the 13th of April. Uh, and many, many others, and I'm showing the dates here, uh, were had by then announced that they were going to open, uh, most of them sometime in early May. As of that date, none of the US companies uh, were predicting anything that precise. I did see just yesterday in the news uh, that, four, that all three American companies, is Fiat Chrysler American? Well, anyway, uh, we're targeting May 18th now uh, to resume limited production. That was in uh, the Wall Street Journal. 
uh, what's this doing to car production? Well, uh, it's dropped obviously uh, a great deal. It dropped first in China because they had the pandemic first and it recovered first uh, in China. And obviously a lot of this is forecasts. This uh, chart was from, well, it was in The Economist. Uh, I think it's in The Economist this week, actually. If you read The Economist, this week's uh, issue has a whole section actually two sections uh, on, on the auto industry and what the uh, pandemic is doing to it. So uh, I only obviously found that uh, after I had made most of these slides, but I added this one to it uh, with their forecast of what's gonna be happening uh, to car production, uh, the percent change on a year earlier. Notice of course, what is this? There's the zero line. Uh, so even before the pandemic, car production was down uh, in almost every place. It looks like uh, the, it wasn't down in Japan and South Korea, but for everybody else uh, it was, but it was down just uh, a, a little bit. Uh, and of course now it's plummeted in, in all of them. Uh, the, the same Economist article from this week uh, talks about the different companies and how vulnerable they are to all of this. Uh, and what this chart shows is how much uh, liquidity they have, uh, that, which I guess is an indication of, of how long they can last if they are producing uh, nothing. And uh, this is showing in the months of liquidity. So BMW had apparently enough money to last for a year uh, before running out. Uh, Fiat Chrysler, only three months. Uh, and, and you see, of course, GM, Ford, and Fiat Chrysler are near the bottom uh, of this list. Uh, so if the thing were to go on much longer, you can see clearly, uh, in, in addition to what it simply does to their profits, uh, they are presumably going to run risks of uh, something more drastic, uh, bankruptcy or something, if they don't get uh, bailout money from the government. Uh, this does not, as far as I know, take into account anything like uh, such, such bailout monies that they might get. Oh, the, the reason for the heading, I just read this this morning, I finally read the whole article. Uh, there's call now in Europe uh, for a cash for clunkers policy uh, to be used there, uh, similarly to what was done uh, after the financial crisis when the auto sector was hurt badly. Um, what about the supply chains? Well, uh, you know, of course, that the supply chains cross the borders multiple times, especially in North America, uh, where the NAFTA is. But I was directed some, uh, maybe now it was a couple of years ago, to, to a series of, of maps here uh, illustrating this. I like to show this to my students uh, when I'm teaching, uh, which I'm not right now. But anyway, uh, this was from the source mentioned down there. It shows some little capacitor that comes in from Asia and and first goes to some place in Colorado. Uh, what's done with it there, I'm not exactly sure, uh, but it then gets shipped to Mexico where it is assembled into a circuit board, which for some reason is shipped back across the border again to El Paso to put, go into a warehouse, but then sent back into Mexico again to be attached to an automatic seat control uh, which then finally is shipped both to uh, the US and to Canada to be attached to the seats, which I suppose don't get shipped too much further before they are put into cars. So the point is, uh, that's just one example, but there's huge numbers of them, not just in the auto sector, but in many of parts uh, that if you start out with them somewhere in the world, they come to the US and then they cross those borders between the US and, and Canada and Mexico time after time after time. If we didn't have NAFTA or USMCA, every time they cross those borders, they'd be paying a tariff. Uh, so that would accumulate and the costs would go up and up and up. And that's of course what uh, NAFTA and the USMCA to the extent that they apply, uh, stop. They, they get rid of those extra costs uh, that are levied in tariffs every time the things cross the border. But they only do that. Oh, and I should say in most of this stuff, uh, the tariff is only two and a half percent. That doesn't sound like much, but when you do it multiple times, it accumulates and makes cars more expensive, not just for sale in the United States to US consumers, but for sale abroad, it makes it more expensive for the US companies or those operating in the US, I should say, not just the US companies, uh, to sell their products in other countries in competition uh, with production abroad that doesn't suffer these extra costs. Uh, so the NAFTA was a huge, 
uh, policy change that encouraged this growth of the supply chains uh, back and forth in within North America, uh, and the uh, the the rules of origin those those the it was sixty two and a half it's now seventy five percent requirement of value added from North America and this high wage requirement both to the extent that they are binding are going to raise costs. Either the firms will have to change where they buy the product in order to satisfy the requirement, or they will have to start, start paying the tariff on things they weren't, wouldn't have paid before. So it's gonna increase the costs uh, for the auto producers. Oh yeah, there's where they are going to. What are the effects of these supply chains? Well, it's incredibly complicated. And aside from giving a little example, as I just did, uh, I don't have anything very uh, clear that's going to, to illustrate it. There was uh, a couple months ago, this pair of charts in The Economist magazine that tried to get at this a little bit. On the left, they tried to categorize industries by how vulnerable they are uh, to uh, cutting of the global supply chain uh, and different industries differed in a couple of dimensions. One is how much inventories do they have? If an industry has lots of inventories, then they can survive better if the supply chain is cut. And the that's the horizontal one. Uh, and the vertical one is the number of alternative sources they have for the products that they uh, purchase, uh, the inputs that they use to their production. And they categorized industries in here. The automotive industry is there. Uh, as you see, it is fairly far to the right in terms of the size of inventories uh, and kind of intermediate in risk in terms of the number of alternative sources. They then use these data to categorize uh, industries in just two ways. Uh, how vulnerable are they to China? Uh, and, and, and how vulnerable are they not uh, to China? I don't know where they put uh, the auto industry, but I would suspect it probably was in the not terribly high exposed, judging from what's on the left here. But then they looked at what happened to the share prices uh, of these companies. And you see, as you would expect, that the more vulnerable industries uh, suffered a greater drop in their stock prices uh, when the pandemic started. What's happened to trade? Uh, well, if trade has dropped, I will mention that in a minute. Uh, one of the things that many of us are concerned about, this is not as directly relevant for uh, the auto sector as for just all of us, uh, is the, the trade in personal protective equipment. Uh, and the fact is that an awful lot of it comes from China. Uh, that's what this is telling us here, that the share of imports from China of personal protective equipment is something like twice as large, not just for us, but for the EU and others, uh, as it is for all other uh, countries, making us, and this was, of course, more relevant back when China was shutting down, uh, much more vulnerable uh, to a, a reduction in exports from, from China. Uh, interestingly, uh, when Chinese exports did decline, uh, and they certainly did as a result of, of their own uh, epidemic. Uh, their exports of personal protective equipment dropped, yes, but dropped by less than everything else. I don't know what that tells us really, uh, except that certainly China was not deliberately uh, favoring their own purchasers of PPE um, more than all the other products. Uh, indeed, they, they, they cut back their exports less uh, than they did of, of other things, which is a bit surprising, uh, perhaps. Turning now to unemployment, uh, we know, of course, that unemployment went up. Uh, for a person who's been looking at, at and, and showing my students graphs of the unemployment rate over time uh, my entire career, uh, this one is just astonishing. Uh, I mean, if it weren't for this recent thing, you know, we'd have scaled, changed the scale and you'd see the bumps in the 2001 and 2008 recessions as looking pretty dramatic. But then you look what happened in 2020 and of course uh, is just an order of magnitude larger uh, than what we'd ever seen before. This shows the same changes uh, uh, for, in somewhat more uh, detail. Uh, turning now to the overall output of the economy as a result of the, of the pandemic. Well, uh, this is what's uh, expected, I should say, to happen uh, to the world economy, to world GDP. Uh, this came out from the International Monetary Fund about two weeks ago. Uh, and you see here uh, what 
actually did happen uh, to world GDP. Uh, and in this history, this goes back all the way to 1980 with quarterly numbers, there was only one time that world GDP fell at all. And it fell by a small, very small fraction of 1%. And generally speaking, world GDP has been rising uh, at around 3% in most years, more some, less in others. Well, what's happening now? Well, the truth is we really don't know. Uh, this report from the IMF uh, was introduced by their chief economist as being incredibly uncertain. They, we've never experienced anything like what we're experiencing right now. So this is a wild, wild guess. Uh, but they are quite convinced it's going to drop, and it's going to drop much, much more than it ever has before in, in recent history. Uh, now, they also are expecting that it's going to come back with a vengeance uh, after the pandemic is over. Of course, the, they seem to be assuming that the pandemic will, in fact, end uh, and much more than I think I feel as confident, but then what do I know? Uh, anyway, this thing is really big uh, for world GDP, and therefore, it's going to be really big uh, for the demand for automobiles in the entire world. World, uh, which is going to matter for this sector. Shortages. Uh, here was a chart I happened to find from somewhere, Bloomberg News, uh, of the shortages of auto component imports. Now, this was back when it was just China uh, that was having the, the epidemic and had shut down a lot of their factories. And they're showing how vulnerable different countries were uh, to this cutting of the supply chain. Mm. Uh, that was quite specific to uh, the fact that it was only China that it shut down. Uh, today, it's not clear. I mean, all, all of the links of the supply chains uh, are now being impacted, and it's not clear that any particular country source uh, is that much more important. Is there a shortage of auto parts? I suppose there is. I looked for charts or pictures of that, and this is the best I could find, and I don't know what to expect to see uh, in the parts department at the Village Ford in Dearborn, uh, but I guess the point is that those shelves are not quite as full uh, as they normally would be. There's a bunch of headlines, uh, which I managed to find, uh, showing uh, had, uh, talking about shortages of auto parts, uh, although the most recent one I found in Bloomberg was that there's going to be a rebound. Uh, and China's rebound now is itself facing a risk of parts shortages, presumably to some extent coming from other countries. Uh, well, okay, I did get done um, a shade earlier than I think I was told to. But anyway, uh, I'm open now for questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Alan. Uh, hold on one second. Uh, sure. Can you stop sharing your screen? Yeah, okay. Yep. Okay. okay. And let me turn everybody else back on. And okay. All right. So we got everybody back online here. Um, uh, thanks again, uh, Alan, for the uh, overview on, on what you see, what you see happening in relationship to globalization and the, and the pandemic. Now, when you look at what we've been uh, what we've been looking at in terms of globalization, we're going back 30 years now for for NAFTA. When you start looking at uh, the goals of globalization as they were implemented 30 years ago, uh, have the goals been met? Um, well. Well, one goal was to increase trade, and it certainly did. Uh, the trade in the NAFTA countries grew far, far more, actually, than my colleagues and I, when we were doing anticipatory uh, studies of the NAFTA, than, than we predicted, uh, because we didn't anticipate uh, the effects that the NAFTA would have on investment uh, across the borders. And, and that, of course, was necessary for the growth of the supply chains. Uh, and, and Indeed, in our models, we didn't have the uh, auto sector uh, having supply chains and anything like this, anything like this extent, uh, be, because before NAFTA, uh, they just weren't importing near, nearly as many parts as they do now. Um, so we missed that. Trade grew far more than was expected, but that was considered uh, the objective, I'm sure, of NAFTA. So that was as expected. Uh, there was one aspect of it that uh, we hoped for and expected and it didn't occur. And that was, uh, the hope was that the NAFTA would raise incomes and wages in Mexico. Uh, 
sufficiently that the uh, pressure for migration from Mexico to the United States would ease. Uh, well, the pressure for migration from Mexico did eventually ease, but uh, not because of a rise in their wages. And, and migration continued uh, through Mexico uh, for uh, other reasons unrelated to, to NAFTA, uh, but the wages didn't go up. Uh, and uh, that's very disappointing. And I don't think we really understand that. Uh, the other thing that, that happened was um, I don't know whether it's to say it was anticipated or not. Uh, we all knew that NAFTA was going to have costs. There were going to be uh, portions of all three economies uh, that would be hurt by it at the same time that other parts were being helped. Uh, one that we knew about uh, was the, uh, uh, the agricultural producers, the farmers uh, in Mexico. When they had to compete with American farms, they were going to be hurt, and they were, and they did. And they, a lot of people had to leave the land and move to the cities, for example. We knew that was going to happen. Uh, and uh, it was unfortunate, and I don't know whether Mexico dealt with it very well. I suspect not. We also knew that there, were going, there was going to be a dislocation of American labor, uh, that some factories in the US would shut down, for those old enough to remember, of course, uh, in the debate 30 years ago about the NAFTA, Ross Perot, who was running for president uh, as a third party candidate, was predicting a great sucking sound uh, as businesses moved to Mexico. Uh, the sound did not occur. Uh, the movement didn't occur in anything like the dramatic level that Ross Perot predicted, but there certainly was some movement and factories did shut down at the same time that other factories expanded. Uh, and those factories that did shut down did cause a dislocation for their workers and for the communities uh, in which they were located if the community supported only maybe one factory. So that the costs of it were expected uh, I think those of us who studied it were expecting that the U.S. labor market could accommodate that, and I think it pretty much did. Uh, the, the losses of, of jobs due to NAFTA were, were actually tiny compared to the losses of jobs that take place all the time in, in the churning of the U.S. labor market. And so uh, they were not, in fact, terribly harmful, but that wasn't the way it was looked at by those who were focused on the particular places where the jobs were lost. Uh, so the antipathy to globalization and to international trade, I think, grew in the general public to some extent. Uh, more than it would have otherwise because of NAFTA. And that antipathy to globalization, of course, we've been seeing uh, more and more uh, in, in recent years. Uh, now, it, it grew a lot faster, I think, uh, and more recently due to the increased trade with China. Uh, after China was uh, entered into the World Trade Organization, uh, their exports to the United States grew, again, far, far more than I think anybody expected. Uh, and for, to some extent, similar reasons. Lots of investment uh, took place in China once it was known that they could not be, we thought, uh, subject to, to higher tariffs. We didn't know Trump would come along. Uh, and, and so, to some extent, I would say the NAFTA had an adverse effect on the public perceptions of the desirability of trade and of globalization. I think those are the main effects that I think of, but I'd be glad to hear what other members of our panel uh, might say about that. Anybody want to jump in? Um, I will, if you don't mind. Um, you know, one of the things that gets uh, portrayed about NAFTA is, you know, the trade agreement itself caused there to be a loss of jobs, especially in the auto sector. And, you know, then you have a bevy of research that said it was automation. No, it was trade. It's both and a bunch of other things. Um, I think the uh, erosion of labor power in, in bargaining has, has led to this as well. If you take you know, a factory in 1979, peak UAW membership, um, the people who swept the floor, did sequencing and kidding, all of those jobs were UAW auto jobs. So they would be captured in the government data for an automotive sector job. And because over time, the bargaining has led to many of those jobs being outside. They're in the service sector now. They're um, you know, a, a company that comes in and does the cleaning. A co another company comes in and does sequencing and kidding. Um, lots of temporary workers as well um, that also show up in the service sector as um, 
uh, team assemblers in service sector. Uh, so there's just been an erosion of jobs that are counted as automotive jobs in the government statistics. And in addition to technology, we've done we've adopted things like the Toyota production system that just allow greater productivity to happen without it's enabled by automation, but it can happen without automation. So there's all these different factors going on that cause there to be fewer jobs, greater productivity in the auto sector. It's not just trade or technology, which is the, the traditional fight that I that is talked about. I know what from the China story was always been an interesting one because when you look at the trade with China, there's and the uh, the effects of globalization with China, you look at some things that happen with China at the at the turn of the century, the introduction of China into the WTO and the growth of the Chinese market, so that companies were going to China, not only to sometimes export back to the US, but they were going to China to sell in China. Uh, it's the largest market in the world by, uh, uh, by a lot now. And even though things are going, you know, who knows how they end up, things are gonna end up this year, but still uh, this is something that has taken place since the turn of the century. And we're looking at the two different angles, I think for China in terms of trade, it was uh, so, oh, companies are leaving. Well, companies are actually establishing sometimes to export as well as to service the, which is something, service the Chinese market, something that did not happen in Mexico. Anybody else on that, on that question? Yeah, well, I think another interesting point about the China, um, you know, Professor Deardorff showed the slides about exposure to China and that that was a bigger risk. And now that China seems to be beyond um, the initial outbreak of, of COVID-19, um, exposure to China might be a positive to some of the companies that are there um, as the Chinese market is recovering as we, you know, it was a sharp recovery at first, but it started to slow down, but it still may be, um, eventually a positive because they have lower vehicle ownership, they have more headroom to grow um, as people move from public transit to personal vehicle ownership. And so it's, uh, you know, what was a, in January, a, a negative may in turn turn to be a positive if their market recovers more strongly than others. Uh, now, Professor uh, Dierdorf, uh, one of the things that that we hear a lot about, and and I think we'll con well. This is something that we'll probably be talking about throughout the our, our conversation here. Was is globalization really just regionalization? Has it transformed to areas of the world that they tend to use local air, local uh, trade agreements, such as NAFTA, or the EU working uh, incorporating the uh, uh, Eastern Europe and Central Europe into the Western Europe, uh, 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 what, would, what would you call it, sphere, sphere of influence, as well as the Asia Pacific group that has very, very much inter, in, uh, trade amongst those, those countries. Mm -hmm. And as a way of dealing with uh, the, having to deal with really long supply lines say from China to the US or the EU to the US, is it, do you see a lot of uh, companies uh, in general just looking regionally to maximize, to, to really make their supply chains more effective? Well, I mean, it's always been true that distance matters in trade. Uh, and indeed, it's one of the strongest empirical relationships you can find in economics uh, is, is the systematic relationship between the amount of trade between two countries and their distance uh, from each other, as well as their size, which obviously matters just as well. Um, and and that, that role has always been true. I think it is fair to say that the role of distance has been declining over time uh, because the cost of transportation uh, has been going down over, over the long you know, uh, decades. Uh, and, and so uh, trade really is global. Now you're right that trade agreements uh, tend to start uh, in, within a region. I mean, NAFTA obviously was a, a great example of that and the European Union, another one. In South America, although it's not as effective, there's the Mercosur agreement uh, amongst a group of countries there. 
Uh, but even those agreements, uh, or not those agreements, but, but those countries uh, have moved to a broader view of what their region is. The Trans-Pacific Partnership was all about trade across uh, the Pacific Ocean, and that's a pretty big distance. Mm -hmm. Now, it's a distance across a uh, part of the, the globe, which is a lot cheaper to move heavy stuff across than across land, uh, which I'm sure is is important for that. That's the reason why uh, it, it was a Trans-Pacific partnership, not a, a partnership between Western Europe and, and Asia, where they would have to move everything along uh, the Silk Road or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but nonetheless, uh, the trade agreements have been expanding their geographic scope. And of course, the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership went ahead without the United States uh, and would have gone ahead with the United States if, if it weren't uh, for Trump. It's also true that, that uh, countries are not only negotiating trade agreements with their neighbors. Uh, I mean, we have them with Australia and New Zealand, which couldn't be uh, further away. And the Europeans do the same sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so... Uh, yes, there is, in particular companies obviously are going to uh, take account of distance and the cost of moving the stuff uh, from their part trading partners uh, to, to here, and that matters a lot for the products. Uh, but I gather uh, for the auto sector, an awful lot of the parts are start out pretty small. Uh, eventually, they get to be the size of a car door or something, and, and then you're not going to move them uh, as far, I guess. Uh, but, but I think distance matters a whole lot less uh, for an awful lot of the things even that go into automobiles. Anybody want to talk about the, anybody else want to uh, weigh in on the regionalization story? Yeah, I can, I can touch on that a little bit. Um, from the supply side, we've seen uh, the extent of regionalization. I mean, it's perfectly exemplified here in North America, but what we're starting to see is our members are investing in um, the rest of Asia to support the Chinese market. And they're really capitalizing on, you know, these small, smaller under, underdeveloped economies, um, developing scale there. And then, you know, importing them into China for ultimate vehicle production. And then the, the, at the same time, you see the same thing in Europe um, and they're leveraging um, the uh, former Soviet states as well as uh, to a smaller extent, Middle East and Africa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, thanks, Joe. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Professor Deardorff. I'm going to we're going to move on to our next speaker. Uh, Jack, uh, Jack Caporal. Uh, as I said, Jack is a uh, associate fellow uh, at the International uh, Business at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. His research focuses on policy areas related to trade, international economic policy, digital trade, innovation, and new technologies. Before joining the uh, center, he was associate editor for Inside U.S. Trade, the premier Organization for International Trade News. There, his work focused on U.S.-China trade relationship, the TTP, uh, NAFTA, dispute settlement and negotiations at the WTO, and the Trump administration's trade policy agenda. Jack, uh, thanks for joining us. Um, I'm going to mute everybody else, and uh, you can start sharing your screen and telling your story. Great. Thanks, Bruce. So I uh, I wanted to hold my uh, ammunition on the regionalization question because I'm actually going to be talking about it uh, a little bit today, um, and there will be some overlap with my comments and uh, you know uh, the the previous two speakers' comments. So I apologize for that, but I think uh, hopefully the conclusions will be at least a little interesting. Um, so I'm gonna you know. A quick overview of the U.S. trade agenda, and I think as I get into the presentation, it's important to remember what the objectives of the Trump administration really are. And you know, the president's favorite word when he talks about trade is reciprocity. He feels as though the United States has been ripped off, and it's his job to seek a fair, reciprocal, balanced uh, outcomes that ensure that U.S. exporters have the same opportunities as foreign exporters that are seeking to get their product into U.S. markets. Uh, second objective, uh, I think, obviously, is to reshore supply chains to bring more production back to the United States. And then his third objective.
article, though, less explicitly stated, but uh, definitely comes through in some of the uh, policy that the administration has carried out uh, that maybe doesn't make as much headline news is, uh, you know, he really wants to protect the United States innovative edge, and he does that through a number of the cross-cutting tools. And so, so where is the administration and its trade agenda? They've concluded uh, two agreements, uh, USMCA yet to come into force in Korea. Uh, they've got a bunch of agreements that are in progress, uh, kind of in limbo or stuck. So the UK US agreement uh, has kind of been in limbo for a while. And now, you know, it's not clear when they'll be able to actually kick off negotiations because of the pandemic. The negotiations with the European Union have been stuck over scoping issues since the 2018 joint statement between uh, President Trump and uh, Jan Claude Juncker when he came to town. Uh, and then they uh, have announced an intend to negotiate a free trade agreement with Kenya. Um, and the earliest that, that those negotiations could start would be later this summer. But again, it's not clear when they'll actually get uh, off the ground. Uh, there's unfinished business, obviously, with Japan and China. I wouldn't put too much stock in a quick conclusion to phase two of either of those agreements for reasons that I can get to a little bit later. And then there are some cross-cutting issues that I think are uh, important, uh, ongoing, and unresolved. So the first category uh, I would put into the you know technology control bucket, and that includes export controls and uh, ongoing efforts, uh, the ongoing process to upgrade uh, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, which uh, screens uh, foreign investment coming into the United States, uh, and the effort to implement FIRMA, uh, which you know upgrades and modernizes the the committee's work. Um, the administration is also working on export controls in areas beyond Huawei and 5G technology areas that uh, get into the automotive industry um, quite a bit, like navigational equipment, autonomous systems, et cetera. And, and uh, the outcome of those rules on those types of technologies could limit not only US ability uh, to export you know, physical products, components that relate to those technologies, but uh, also could limit movement of people who have knowledge about those technologies and change the uh, foreign direct investment uh, situation uh, into the U.S. for companies uh, that are seeking to partner with U.S. companies uh, uh, or establish operations in the U.S. Uh, that deal with some of those uh, emerging technologies um, of particular consequence here is how the United States is applying some of these rules to China, uh, which I can get to a little bit later as well. Obviously, the steel and aluminum 232 tariffs uh, remain and the threat of auto tariffs uh, has not completely gone away. As uh, Professor Deerdorf mentioned, the WTO is in uh, not great shape. The dispute settlement function uh, has been uh, hamstrung, um, I would say, uh, or put on pause for the time being. And the negotiating arm of the WTO hasn't produced much in about uh, 20 years now. Uh, and so there are big question marks um, about you know what the proper forum is for multilateral global trade negotiations going forward, whether that phase of you know big global trade agreements has come to an end, uh, and kind of as a fundamental feature of the trading system, as a result, we'll move into a more uh, regionalized approach to trade negotiations, given uh, the WTO's uh, inability to properly function. And then finally, we have. Uh, the US, EU, and Japan trilateral efforts, which are really focused on confronting non-market economic practices coming out of China. And uh, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a platform for these three countries to negotiate new rules on subsidies, state-owned enterprises, and technology transfer. And you know, there's a, 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 the question that I have and that I think about quite often is whether or not this type of cooperation is a little bit more ad hoc a group of like-minded countries that seek to upgrade specific WTO rules. Uh, you know, whether that type of cooperation uh, will be uh, what we see more often moving forward um, because of difficulties at the WTO and difficulties in really negotiating really, really large uh, uh, trade agreements that include a lot of different partners. So US-China trade relationship here on the right, we have uh, just a, uh, U.S. Uh, auto exports and U.S. part exports to China. Uh, obviously, there's a imbalance in both areas. We import a lot more parts to China uh, than they import from us, and we send them a lot more automobiles than uh, they send to us. 
you can see in 2018, there was a dip as well as 2019 relative to 2017, which may have something to do with the trade war, which is ongoing. I would note, uh, you know, the other way that I think about the Trump administration's uh, trade policy and, and particularly as it uh, deals with automobiles is that, you know, there's a spectrum, uh, which I have a slide on later of really extreme managed trade uh, and, and pretty standard, you know, trade liberalization that's negotiated with its partners. And with the US-China arrangement, you have managed trade to the extreme, right? So the uh, phase one agreement includes purchasing commitments, which Bruce talked about, 78 billion of which have to do with manufactured goods, which includes automobiles. The line, you know, uh, number for, you know, what value of automobiles China has to purchase to fulfill their commitments hasn't been made and won't be made public because both sides didn't want to create market distortions that could be, or didn't want to create a situation where companies could exploit market distortions, et cetera. Um, but, you know, basically you now have a situation where uh, the, the, I think the trust that was established and the economic goodwill that was established after January phase one agreement uh, has kind of disappeared. So, uh, you know, the coronavirus, I think, was would have been a good opportunity for the two countries to come together and cooperate on a global issue. Instead, they're kind of trading blame with each other and and uh, and and trading barbs uh, with each other. And it's added a, another level of uh, mistrust to a relationship that's already fraying on a whole uh, range of issues. And it's also created an economic, global economic situation that calls into question whether China can meet its phase one purchasing uh, commitments. And the agreement doesn't leave very many outs for when there is a disagreement. It escalates pretty quickly into, into one country or the other having the opportunity to just withdraw from the agreement if they feel as though it's not being implemented as agreed to. Uh, so the stakes are really high, um, particularly given that China is uh, the, you know, the most lucrative uh, market for automobile sales. But you know, the options are so limited because the relationship has been strained. Um, and, and the agreement itself doesn't offer very many outs. Um, you know, so in this instance, I would say that, you know, regionalization is, is the name of the game. I don't think that the prevailing U.S. strategy will be to build to export to China. Um, that being said, the joint venture requirements in China and concerns about intellectual property, theft, and technology transfer uh, raises questions about, um, you know, how uh, appetizing it is for a U.S. company to say we're going to set up in China or 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 partner with companies in China uh, solely for the purpose of exporting to China or, or serving the, uh, and and so there you know uh, it might be worthwhile to look at uh, RCEP rules, which is which are set to come in uh, either later this year or next year as as a way to serve China from the region. Uh, uh, which again uh, trends with the overall regionalization dynamic. Uh, U.S. Korea, as, as Bruce uh, already noted in his overview, there was some outcome on U.S. exports um, of vehicles that met U.S. safety standards uh, was lifted from twenty-five thousand to fifty thousand. You know, which is really a limited impact because in 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 2019 we exported a total of 57,000 automobiles to Korea, um, and you know you can see this top chart. The agreement itself didn't have really any impact in in 2019. Um, this outcome was the least managed outcome um, between Korea, China, uh, and uh, USMCA, US Japan. Um, so automobiles were left for uh, a phase two agreement. Um, we'll see if the Trump administration gets around to that and uh, and how quickly they can close that agreement. Uh, they've left basically all of the really difficult issues for last and resolved, I think, a lot of really low hanging fruit. And so it's an interesting negotiation, negotiating uh, a strategy because you know they've essentially resolved all of the easy things that one could give away to you know, grease the wheels on some of the harder issues. Um, you know, Japan, their uh, approach, I think, also fits into the regionalization trend. So uh, the U.S. withdrew from CPT, from TPP, and instead of uh, kind of following the U.S. lead and, and going on its own, Japan doubled down, uh, pursued CPTPP, really led uh, its entry into force 
and now they're recruiting or or uh, or really looking at bringing uh, new members on board into CPTPP and in, in part um, because of their experience with the pandemic and the early outbreak in China disrupting uh, supply chains across a, across a lot of industries. Their uh, reaction after that was uh, to double down on CPTPP and expand its membership to create a buffer uh, from its from its reliance on 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 China. Um, just from you know uh, auto supply chain perspective, it's an interesting case because Japan had a relatively low case count early on, but still experienced um, automobile plant closures. Um, in large part because of supply chain disruptions, not because they were necessarily sending people home from work like we're doing in the United States. And so I think the, the lesson there is that the pandemic, you know, has revealed um, that disruptions uh, can occur across stages. So you have supplier and supply uncertainty, there's process uncertainty, and then there's massive demand, demand uncertainty. And that can all add up into, you know, cascading disruptions. Um, uh, which can really affect business operations, uh, particularly in the automobile sector. So, uh, USMCA, uh, this was some. This was an agreement that um, you know we, the program that I work with uh, at CSIS, we did a lot of work on last year, and we particularly looked at the automobile uh, rules of origin as a case study for how rules of origin could be uh, implemented in and used. Um, to further uh, uh, economic objectives uh, in other agreements. And, um, you know, I think that rules of origin um, will play a larger role in trade agreements that are negotiated uh, by this administration and potentially by future administrations that share similar objectives uh, and feel as though uh, the United States and its trade arrangements hasn't necessarily gotten uh, a, a fair a fair deal um, and I would just you know uh, point to recent comments by US Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer about USMCA uh, and it's July 1 the announcement that it would enter into force on on July 1 and he said the crisis and recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic demonstrates that now more than ever the United States should strive to increase manufacturing capacity and investment in North America the USMCA's entry into force is a landmark achievement in that effort. So I think he he kind of under he views USMCA and the rules of origin as as a way uh, to protect the U.S. supply, the North American automobile supply chain, and protect uh, and insulate uh, U.S. auto production, auto jobs from uh, global forces uh, and and global supply chain disruptions, um, and and so. You know, his comments come even though auto groups and a bipartisan group of lawmakers have asked the administration to delay entry into force because of, one, the complexity of the rules, which uh, Bruce and and the professor talked about, uh, plus the complexities of the supply chain uh, and disruption caused by, caused by COVID. And so the news recently is that on July 1st, um, you know, the three countries have agreed that the agreement will enter into force. And that is the day that regulations for implementing the automotive uh, automotive rules of origin uh, must be issued. There are still a lot of outstanding question marks, um, particularly uh, how the rules of origin, which will be the most stringent and complex automotive rules of origin in any trade agreement, how those rules of origin will actually be implemented, whether or not uh, US producers uh, will qualify for uh, these, uh, you know, extension program to your extensions uh, that will help them comply uh, with the rules um, basically how USTR is you know judging or or approving uh, those extension uh, plans is up in the air uh, and then you know the other really big question mark um, is how the uh, labor value content requirement, uh, will be able will will be uh, will be tracked, um, and so implications. You know, again, it's important to recognize the administration's goal was to increase automobile and parts production in the United States. And based on the research that we did, as well as the economic analysis done by the USITC, International Trade Commission, uh, as well as some other in international bodies, you know, 
the rules will likely result in a short-term cost as, as, as companies have to reconfigure their supply chains in order to meet the more stringent rules. Um, it, it will probably result in some long-term investment in the United States and things like assembly and core part production, which includes the larger parts like engines and, and gearboxes, et cetera. Um, but you know, overall, the costs that come with compliance will weaken uh, the U.S. Uh, auto industry's global position, right? So um, vehicle costs will increase, which will increase the, the cost of exports. Uh, and, you know, es essentially um, the competitive picture for the United States uh, globally will decline while its uh, regional position uh, may become a little bit stronger. And so that's uh, a trade-off that the administration, I imagine, is, is willing to take. Um, you know, the other conclusion we came to from our study of the issues that home field advantage helps. So the companies that have been uh, operating in the United States the longest uh, will tend to have an easier job complying with the rules. Um, and finally, you know, just uncertainty uh, abound about implementation uh, and, and how exactly, uh, you know, companies throughout the supply chain, whether it's an OEM or a tier one or tier two supplier, uh, uncertainty about, you know, the how they'll comply with the rules and the process in which compliance will be determined. And uh, I think as everybody knows, uncertainty uh, can generate costs uh, uh, throughout uh, uh, throughout the supply chain. So here, uh, you know, turning to, to, to COVID um, and to kind of tie it all together, there have been two trade responses to COVID, right? So one has been a kind of gut reaction uh, towards self-sufficiency, uh, you know, reshore supply chains, et cetera, uh, and as, as a way of building resiliency um, for this crisis and also for future crisis, crises. Uh, and the other response uh, has been to supply chains, right? So you don't want to be reliant on any one country for any one individual part. So if that country goes offline, uh, you know, you have a, a supply chain problem. Um, but I think the actual more meaningful question that businesses um, and governments will have to grapple with after the crisis is efficiency versus resiliency, right? And so I think the name of the game uh, it has been efficiency for a long time. How do you maximize, you know, how do you maximize value in the short term and how do you maximize revenue uh, in, in the short term? And uh, that drive for efficiency is what's generated global value chains that that stretch around the world. Um, and now I think you'll get a second look at uh, resiliency through uh, regionalization and resiliency through uh, self-sufficiency, which will obviously generate uh, short-term costs, but maybe be uh, more sustainable uh, um, longer term. And I think here, you know, government policy can have an impact. So. I think rules of origin are a really clear example of government policy. The USMCA rules of origin are a really clear example of government policy that tries to build in uh, a regional a, a regional approach. Uh, essentially, it really strongly encourages a regional approach. Um, and you know whether or not that creates a type of resiliency uh, necessary to respond, respond to future crises, I think uh, I, I think remains to be seen. But um, you know. Essentially, it wouldn't surprise me if the USMCA rules of origin approach are are is replicated in a in future agreements with this objective in mind. Um, so, you know, the other question about regionalization that I ask quite a bit is whether this is a a, a new trend or uh, an existing trend, and in other words, whether the pandemic puts the global economy on a new path towards regionalization or whether or not it simply is accelerating existing trend. And I think it is more accelerating an existing trend. Uh, so, you know, there are four factors in my mind that are most influential. So population growth, uh, fat, the fastest growing part of the world is the Asia Pacific. Uh, and, and it's also the region that uh, is home to the most regional trade agreements, according to the World Trade Organization. Uh, it's where, you know, the majority of the EU's uh, trade agreements under negotiation 
are taking place. It's home to two mega regional trade agreements, CPTPP and RCEP. Uh, and, and, you know, that's not a coincidence. Second uh, is the Asia Pacific is also home to the, the fastest growing part of the global middle class, which is what uh, this chart here on the right shows where global middle class consumption is taking place. And you can see East Asia and the Pacific and South Asia are, are projected to dominate uh, to dominate there. Third, you know, sustainability and concerns about climate change drive regionalization in my mind for two reasons. One, uh, you know, you can cut down on your carbon footprint by shrinking your supply chains. And the most efficient way to do that is to take a regional approach. Uh, and second, as uh, you know, climate change accelerates, um, the risks of having a really long drawn out supply chain uh, increase as uh, extreme weather events become uh, uh, more likely and occur on a more regular basis. And so one way to protect against uh, those types of events uh, and, and reduce risk, mitigate risk, is to shrink your supply chains and, and uh, make them make them shorter. And then uh, third uh, is uh, technology and and uh, the impact that technology has on reducing labor costs. And so, you know, I think the pandemic will accelerate trends towards automation because you know robots can't get sick uh, and you don't have to worry about a, a pandemic. You know, you don't have to send your robot home if there's a pandemic. Um, but along with automation becomes a uh, less of a premium placed on cheap labor. Um, and, and so, uh, I think that also will, uh, allow for more regionalization to occur. Um, and so what does that mean for, uh, us trade policy? I mean, there's a spectrum to choose from, whether it's the most managed or least managed, uh, uh, which is TPP over here on 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 the right. Um, and I think, you know, as a result of the pandemic, the scales, at least in the short term, have been shifted more towards the the managed side of trade, uh, where policymakers will look to include things like rules of origin, novel rules of origin, and complicated rules of origin to encourage. Uh, you know, investment and uh, and production in uh, certain in uh, in certain parts of the world, um, essentially. Um, and so, I will leave it at that. Happy to take questions. I think you're still muted, Bruce. Uh, let's unmute everybody here. Very good. Thank you very much for your, there we go. Thank you very much for your presentation. I think you really hit on a lot of points that we were discussing a little earlier, got a little more detail into the regionalization story. Uh, I think that that was very interesting. Um, one of the questions, and, and I guess I would say this to the audience, uh, please feel free to uh, enter questions into the, uh, uh, the Google uh, form that we, uh, we sent you a link to uh, this morning and also yesterday. Uh, and uh, one of the questions that came up uh, for you, Jack, is do you think the pandemic will accelerate moving manufacturing out of China and back to the US? And if so, what will be some of the long-term effects be on both China and the US? So, uh, I don't think the pandemic is the f a fundamental driver in the U.S.-China uh, economic relationship or in the manufacturing picture between the U.S. and China, right? I think uh, more and more U.S. companies are coming to understand that uh, the way to serve the market in China um, is to operate in China or take advantage of uh, some of, of, of nascent regional agreements like RCEP, right? And that, you know, US-China trade tensions are not gonna be going away anytime soon. And that, that includes uh, issues like tariffs and it also includes um, things like export controls and the other web of, of emerging regulatory issues that US companies have to deal with with doing business in China. Um, so, you know, I think whether or not the the coronavirus 
accelerates the departure of manufacturing from China back to the U.S. Uh, is is kind of secondary or or tr would track with an already existing trend. Um, uh, you know, well, if I might, in auto, um, the Chinese auto market has been slowing in growth, and we've seen increases in wages. So we both of those things were a trend before this happened. Uh, that was leading manufacturing out of China, not necessarily back to the U.S. though, um, and I'll talk about some of that in my presentation. But we did see, you know, dispersion to other East Asian countries, and then when the tariffs came on, you know, many uh, industries, and you know, for example, tooling. Right before the tooling uh, tariffs went on in September, you know, half-built tools were shipped out to South Korea, to Taiwan. Uh, to Thailand and other places where they could, and even in East Europe, uh, where they could be finished uh, before they came back to the U.S. So there were trends going on already. I think the tariffs uh, ratcheted that up and accelerated some of those trends. And I don't, I agree with Jack that I don't know that the coronavirus, since it's everywhere now, um, is a particular movement. Anybody else want to jump in on that one? Uh, when I look at the, the suppliers, uh, the charts that you were showing, Jack, about the, uh, the amount of, of imports of Chinese components that come to the U.S., at least in terms, I think you had it in terms of value, it's significant. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's significant. So even though um, we're, this, there may be a, a movement away from China, the numbers really are quite high in terms of the, the imports of parts, not vehicles. Yeah, so that's definitely true. I think that was a driving factor behind um, the administration's approach to the rules of origin in USMCA. I think there was a really large growing concern that, uh, you know, we were building cars in North America and 40% or more of the vehicle was essentially uh made in china and you know that that concept with this administration was not going to fly i think there is also growing concern that um that uh production in mexico in particular um that a lot of that was a lot of the value there was also being sourced from china um and so in response the administration's created really a web of requirements through rules of origin, um, you know, that are intended, yes, to, to protect American workers from unfair competition or lower wages in, in Mexico, for example, but also to protect uh, North America from uh, China's capacity to, to produce parts. And then, you know, looking forward, I think what the administration uh, is doing on export controls uh, in particular, um, you know, and how they're approaching, you know, technology competition with China uh, more broadly um, could have implications for uh, trade in, in components, particular high-tech components um, and uh, vehicles in general um, as well. So, you know, the more electrified, the more autonomous and the more connected vehicles become, the more advanced the technology is required in those vehicles. Uh, and, and the more you start to butt up against, uh, you know, really big questions that about US China technology competition mm -hmm. and right. how the two countries want to deal with that. Right, right. Joe, were you seeing this, uh, the China effects on, on uh, with your suppliers? Um, you know, I, I think that chart is some misleading when you when you look at it, uh, you know, if you add up the, you know, the total imports of any type of good that's crossing the border between two major economies, such as the United States and, and China, it's going to look massive. Um, and agreed, like, you know, it's, there's a big imbalance, because we're finishing the product here. And I have some, um, I'll show a little bit later that, um, you know, you know, the value of imported goods within the parts that are produced domestically only makes up about 30% of their value. Uh, so we're, there's a lot more value added uh, that's, that, that is being, you know, underrepresented in, uh, by looking at, you know, the, the trade balance data. Okay. 
Very good. Thank you. I, I think the other point too with um, China is that a lot of their imports, parts imports are going to aftermarket. So when you go to a Napa auto store, um, your headlights, your replacement air filters, oil filters, spark plugs, all of that is generally being sourced from low cost countries like China. And you know the part that's going into OE production is much, much smaller than that total volume of parts. Uh, good point, good point, Kristen, yeah. Any percentages on, on that? Percentages of uh, uh, aftermarket versus uh, OE parts? We think it's way more than half. Um, okay. That's a, <laughs> you can't tell. There is no separate code um, for parts that are going to, to retail um, aftermarket versus right. to right. OE. Um, it's well more than half of the Chinese imports are going to aftermarket. Though. Interesting, interesting, good point. Um, I think we'll take a, a, a quick 10 minute break here. Let, let our uh, viewers uh, take, a, take a break as well. And uh, we'll come back in 10 minutes. Thank you very much guys and gals. I'm going to mute everybody right now.
Bruce, I can't hear you. Yeah, I'm not. I have the same problem. Thanks for letting me know. <laughs> Is it better now? Yep. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it helps if I turn on my microphone. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thanks everybody for uh, sticking with us, and I hope you're enjoying the conference. As I said, uh, as I said to myself a little bit ago, with my microphone turned off, that <laughs> that I've been uh, continuing to learn every uh, new things from uh, from our discussion. Uh, our next speaker is Christian Dizik from uh, the Center for Automotive Research. She's the Vice President of Labor, uh, uh, Industry, Labor, and Economics at CAR. She joined in 2005 and has more than 25 years experience as a researcher and policy analyst. Uh, the team that she leads uh, focuses on, uh, 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 on economic analysis, forecasting and modeling, policy and economic development. Uh, her research includes analyzing the competitive cost position of the US automotive industry and evaluating how different tax, trade, or industrial policies and incentives could impact overall automotive sales, production, and employment. Prior to joining CAR, uh, Kristen served as the Associate Director of the Michigan Manufacturing Technology Center and has worked for the US Congress, the UAW, uh, and General Motors. She earned her BA in economics, uh, MPP in public policy, and MS in Industrial and Operations Engineering, all from the University of Michigan. Uh, Kristen, again, thank you for joining us. Um, thank you. You can uh, share your screen and take it away. Okay. Uh, so you should be seeing this now, yes? You got okay. it. Okay, there. Um, well, you know, thank you for having me and, uh, you know, it's, I've learned a lot from the first few pre presentations as well. You know, I want to note that, you know, the auto industry is no stranger to crisis. Um, it seems like we're already in some kind of crisis recently, uh, and the supply chain in particular is, um, I'm, I'm glad I'm not in supply chain management. Uh, you know, there's been, uh, fires and, um, tornadoes and uh, tsunamis and floods, uh, bankruptcies and insolvencies throughout the supply chain. And the big problem we have is we need all the parts to show up all at the same time to make a car. Um, most people want a complete set when they go to the dealer to buy a new vehicle. So it's, it's a very um, complex orchestration um, across the supply chain. And here in the United States, um, something like 78% of our suppliers are firms that have fewer than 100 people. Um, so we're dependent on a lot of small businesses throughout the United States um, and a lot of businesses across the world uh, to support our manufacturing. And you know, one example is you know, on April 13th, there was a tornado in South Carolina that hit a Borg Warner plant. Um, that Borg Warner plant is tied to Ford production. Uh, there was news just um, at the break uh, that that uh, Borg Warner plant is expected to restart in early May, but you know they had a tornado hit their plant April 13th, and now they're turning around and coming back up. Um, just a few years ago, there was a fire um, at a magnesium casting supplier in West Michigan that shut down all Ford F-Series pickup truck production in the United States for some period of time. Um, and the F-Series is approximately nine or 10% of all US vehicle output. Um, so there are tremendous efforts put in place to work around supply chain kinks and bottlenecks and disruptions that are happening all the time. And now we are looking at COVID-19 is a <laughs> crisis writ large um, on those supply chain managers and how they're going to work around um, all of the disruption that they are yet to face. Um, when it first came through, um, we were looking at, well, what parts are sourced from China and which companies are particularly vulnerable? And you know, how is that going to impact manufacturing here? Uh, you know, everybody has some Chinese content. And as I said, you need all the parts. Um, then it moved to Europe and to Italy uh, first, and that you know, exposed differentially some of the automakers here in North America, the European producers and FCA, more dependent on Europe sourcing than some of the others, but still we need all the parts. And now it's here in North America and, you know, Detroit has been an epicenter of the disease outbreak. 
Um, so, you know, we see things maybe a little differently <laughs> around here, um, but the course of the disease in the rest of the country is still to play out. So we will continue to have disruptions from different regions as the disease outbreak spreads. And then the big concern, um, which I'll talk about in this presentation, is what's going on with Mexico and the Mexico restart. So we really need a synchronized restart, a slow, steady, sustained restart to this industry because we unwind capital very quickly um, if we start, stop, start, stop. Um, so that's my introduction to my presentation, um, but I'm going to get right into you know, the coronavirus um, threats are supply chain disruption, the continuing health crisis, especially among the workforce, uh, sharp demand drop from consumers. Um, in April, we were down about 50% projections, I'm sorry, in March. And projections for April were much uh, more um, uh, negative than they are likely may turn out. Um, there was recent uh, information from both J.D. Power and Cox Automotive that they're projecting April sales to be um, at a 7.5 million SAR pace. Uh, we were at about 11.4 million pace in March. Um, and for um, level setting last year was like 16.8, um, 16.9. So um, we're, you know, much lower pace of sales, but April is holding up a little better because there are some regions of the country that are, you know, pandemic, what pandemic? And there's great deals right now. 0% um, financing, 84 months, no payments for three months. Um, Hyundai's brought back its job assurance program. Um, so if you ha have a job and you have money and you wanted to buy a car, there's, um, there's a lot of good deals um, out there. And so that's held up um, our market a little bit better. Um, and one area that I've spent a lot of my time on and I uh, is on the financial impacts. Um, you know, there's a lot of concern about how long can these automakers last? And I know Professor Deerdorf showed um, some slides about, you know, which automaker had how much money to last how long. Um, you know, there have been a lot of changes since that slide was put together. Um, most of the automakers have uh, credit facilities, revolving credit facilities that they've been able to tap. You know, the credit market is working now that it wasn't in 2008 and 2009. Um, Ford went to the market uh, for an $8 billion bond um, and has had takers at that. You know, they're borrowing on a 50 year bond at a fairly high interest rate in order to turn around and offer consumers 0% interest. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of other private uh, capital um, exercise as well as pulling back from some of those investments in long-term technology bets, um, pulling back the dividends, uh, just doing a lot to conserve cash. So the months that they can last, the D3 um, look like they can last um, in, you know, more than the three months FCA was on the chart for. Um, Ford is saying they can last through the end of the year and GM is a little stronger, uh, but their balance sheets are a lot stronger now. The real concern I have is the supply chain. Suppliers have been, um, they get paid on 30 to 60 day terms. So what work they did before the shutdown, they're still getting paid for through mid-May. Um, once we hit mid-May, their revenue stops and they have um, restart capital requirements that they're going to need to get going. So that is what really does us in if we have a start stop um, return to production is that the suppliers start and if they stop again, then they're getting paid for a little while, but then, you know, those on those 30 to 60 day terms and it just really unwinds very quickly. Um, and I'm not going to spend much time on that in this presentation, but the health um, concerns in the plants as we return are very significant. Um, we did a webinar at the Center for Automotive Research uh, with um, a couple of leaders at Magna talking through some of the restart playbooks and what's being what's going to be required in redesigning jobs, implementing new safety procedures, um, having workers wear PPE. Um, if you saw the 60 Minutes piece at, um, about GM and Ford and how they're um, producing uh, ventilators and personal protective equipment and the, and the procedures they put in to protect the workforce in those realms, um, has been has been significant. Ford's using a watch, a Samsung watch that shows, you know, will alert you if anybody's within six feet of you. And it can also be used for contract tracing. 
uh, so you know who was in contact with anybody who does come down with the disease. These are all procedures that have been honed um, in China, in Korea, and other parts of the world where production has restarted. Uh, the UAW remains um, concerned that their, the safety of their members is uh, protected. And you may have seen several announcements from the president of the UAW asking for um, not to return in early May uh, and not to return until there was um, more safety procedures in place and more testing, um, which is one of the big differences, you know, especially with the South Korean restart. Um, there's um, just ubiquitous throughout the South Korean uh, populace, there is testing, uh, tight te testing, isolation, and uh, containment of the disease uh, more so than we're seeing here because of the lack of testing. So these are, you know, the ways that we're seeing some threats to the U.S. firms and consumer demand drop. You know, we don't know what we don't know, <laughs> and um, you know, April may be less bad than we thought. Um, but, you know, is this a U? Is this an L? Is it a V? Is it a W um, on the recovery? We're just, you know, we're going to wait to see what's happening there. Motor vehicle sales during economic slowdowns. This is comparing the 2008-2009 slowdown uh, to what we're seeing right now um, with some projections. Um, in China, you know, the Chinese market was not nearly as large in 2008 and 2009. Um, so they did not they were fairly insulated from the uh, uh, Great Recession. Um, so this is you know, the play out um, from the months overlay uh, from those periods. Europe um, was affected just about as much as we were um, and has seen a very strong drop, uh, downward drop in 2020. And then in the US, uh, similarly, um, we were starting to fall off uh, a little bit earlier um, and following a fairly similar trajectory uh, to the 2008-2009 slowdown. There's a lot different about this 2000, than 2008 and 2009. As I mentioned, credit markets weren't functioning then. We were on a long downward trajectory, especially in the domestic automaker share of the market. Um, there was a lot of capacity in the industry, which there isn't now. Um, so there's a lot of reasons to think that this is not going to play out um, in much the same way. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about globalization and if, excuse me if some of this is elementary for some of you in the auto industry, but I knew we had a broad audience here so I wanted to um, to cover a number of, of factors that um, help us think about the globalization and trade. First is trade is allowing consumers a tremendous amount of choice. We only make 115 models, nameplates of vehicles in the United States. Um, and the F-150 there uh, this is the number one vehicle that we make, almost nine or 10% of production. But you can go to a dealer and buy 363 different models. Um, here is the beautiful Ferrari California of which there were 10 sold um, last year. Um, so you, you know, there are some models like the Ford Mustang made here in Michigan. It's, this is the only production place for that vehicle and it's sold around the world. And so trade allows us to have exports of, of unique vehicles. It allows us to have a greater choice for consumers. Um, about a third of the vehicles that are sold here, 120 nameplates have volumes of less than 5,000. Um, so that's not sufficient to support domestic production of um, those models. So if we made, if we retrenched and we made everything in the United States and only bought US built vehicles, we would have a, a lot fewer cho uh, vehicles to choose from. It offers, also offers, offers us lower prices. So this is a track of the CPI um, from the beginning of NAFTA uh, to uh, 2019. And here you see that um, under NAFTA, since NAFTA took effect, inflation for all items is up 75% and inflation for new vehicles is up 8.7%. So a very flat line really for the new vehicle prices. Um, it's not just because of NAFTA, it's also because of sourcing to China and Eastern Europe and other low cost countries um, and a number of other factors that have led us to have greater content of vehicles at much lower prices. Um, oftentimes when I show this to people, they say, oh yeah, but the average sticker price is $38,000 now. It's, it just feels a lot more expensive, but everything else we're buying is relatively more expensive. And you know, a lot of this is due to that integration here in North America and the reliance on nearshoring uh, to Mexico. Um, 
We cannot self-supply the vehicles that we sell to U.S. consumers. This is the math. Um, we produced 10.7 million vehicles last year. We exported 1.9, we imported 8.3, um, and we got 17.1 million sales. Um, of those vehicles sold in the United States, 54% were built in the United States. And of those, 29% were built by U.S. firms. And there I'm counting GM, Ford, FCA, and Tesla. Um, a quarter, 25%, were built by the international firms that operate here in the United States. So Honda, Toyota, Nissan, Subaru, uh, BMW, Daimler, those. Um, when we look to the imports, um, more than half of our imports, 15% uh, come from Mexico, 9% from Canada, from our NAFTA or USMCA partners. And half of those are coming from the GM, Ford, and Chrysler um, operations in our neighboring countries. Uh, it's important to note that that is not a really new thing. Uh, Ford has been continuously producing vehicles in Mexico since 1925. Um, We've had that global reach of this auto industry for a long time, but we've really changed what that global reach means and how it's how it's defined and how we um, leverage it for um, efficiencies and uh, and greater um, sustainability of the industry. Our next largest trading partner, Japan, uh, as was covered in previous administration or previous presentations here, um, we are working on a trade agreement with Japan. It currently does not, uh, the freight phase one deal does not cover autos. South Korea, they inked the Chorus deal and, and re-upped it um, during the Trump administration. So I expect that there's stability in the South Korea-US relationship. And then Germany and the UK and everybody else um, make up a very small segment of US sales. So it's you know 7% here. Um, China is in there. It's a tiny, tiny, tiny little wedge. And we do export more vehicles to China than we import. Um, and there are trade agreements going on with basically all of the remaining um, or trade negotiations with all of the various sources of vehicles. We get parts from all over the world um, and we have for a long time. The countries in green, that are the top 35 automotive parts import sources and they account for 99% of all of our US auto parts imports. Um, just four countries account for 70%, Mexico, Canada, China, and Japan. Um, and Canada and China have trained places in 2019, uh, largely due to the ongoing trade dispute with China. Um, but China, Canada was third and now it's second, uh, but we are heavily reliant, 50% uh, of our parts imports coming from our neighboring countries here. And so the implementation of USMCA is extremely important uh, to the long-term health of this industry. Anybody remember the world car? There was a, there was a movement um, and, and a trend um, in the eighties uh, talking about the world car. So before uh, this, we had a lot more regional production and even regional within the United States. There were branch plants. They were, you know, the plant in Van Nuys, California, way back when, made all the models that it needed to make for the California market. We didn't have platforms and uh, that uh, logistics to get the vehicles from one plant to the rest of the market. They were more regionalized. Um, so as we move to a platform strategy, this world car came about. So the first world car that I can think of might be uh, the Volkswagen Beetle, made in Germany, but sold all over the world um, and, and pretty homely as this ad implies. Um, the Corolla, the top selling vehicle in 1974 made only in Japan um, at that time, but that was you know, considered the year of the small car um, and then Ford and the Ford Escort. Um, the Ford Escort was made in multiple places in Europe and in the United States uh, for different markets. They were not the same vehicle though. The world car was not the same vehicle and that has changed dramatically. The, the uh, current version of the Ford Escort, the Ford Focus, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about in just a second is um, perhaps you know, more of an embodiment of what the world car was meant to be. I'm taking Ford as an example. I'm picking on you guys from Ford who are on the call, I'm sorry. Um, but take, for example, the Ford truck platform, the T3 platform. They can make four different vehicles on that platform. Uh, the F-Series pickup trucks at various levels of um, beefiness um, and the Expedition and the Navigator. They make those in four plants, all located in the United States. So that supply chain is likely very regional um, and very uh, 
upper Midwest focused even, um, because that's a vehicle that while we do export some, we don't export a lot, um, mainly for the North American market. Now, if you turn to the small car platform, the C1, which is now the C2, um, the, fo the focus is on that platform, but they also have made the C-Max, the Escort in China, the Escape, the Kuga, the Transit Connect, the Terneo, the Lincoln MKC, a number of different models um, on the same platform. Uh, they make it in uh, nine different plants around the world. And when you've got one platform made in nine different plants around the world, and uh, there is some regional variation, but let's say you wanted to source the windshield wiper motor for this plant. Um, where are you going to source it from? Excuse me. My son is outside my window waving at me. I think he's locked out. <laughs> um, so uh, he's going to have to stay outside <laughs> for a little bit. Um, so you're sourcing the windshield wiper motor. Um, you might source it from one supplier. And that supplier may have three plants around the world. And so those three plants around the world are supplying your nine production locations. So are you going to have a different supply chain for the one that's made in North America, the Ford Escape made in Kentucky, uh, for the vehicles, uh, parts that are not differentiable, that the customer is not going to notice, um, and that you know can be built really anywhere. And I think that's the underlying thing of the world car. I think we've you know finally evolved to these greater efficiencies in the use of global platforms. And not only that, the companies have gone from a whole wide plethora of platforms to just a handful um, as they've gained greater and greater efficiencies um, in manufacturing. Um, I know that we've seen this chart before, but um, you know this is from the Peterson Institute and the ramp up of the US-China trade war and the tariffs and how that has um, escalated over time. So I'll skip over this, but the consequences for the auto industry and here um, my red dots amount to the um, HS codes that were covered in tranche one that covered cars and trucks. Um, my blue dots are in tranche three, which covered most of auto parts trade. And what we're looking at is if it's to the right of the center line, that means there's been an increase in imports from China between 2018 and 2019. And if it's uh, to the left, there's been a decrease north of the center line, the belt line. That means there's been an increase in uh, imports from the rest of the world year over year. And if it's in the bottom left quadrant, that means there's been, or bottom half, it's been there's, there's been less imports from the rest of the world. So that bottom left quadrant is basically weak demand. Um, the top left quadrant is substitution. So where we were getting things from China, we're now getting it from other places in the rest of the world. And if I showed you all of the countries we did this chart on, the biggest winner here is Mexico, where we've seen a great shift from uh, pieces that were in, in uh, auto parts that were sourced um, from China that are now being sourced from Mexico. And these categories that are here cover a vast majority of the trade that we have be between the US and China. Um, I won't go into great details, but this is my version, <laughs> version of the changes between NAFTA and USMCA. Um, I think you know it's important to note that NAFTA really explicitly allowed roll-ups. So there was this tracing list and there was a set number of parts that were on this tracing list. And if the part that you were um, producing or using was not on the tracing list, it was called deemed originating. And that meant that you could count that as North American content toward your toward your rules. And now they um, they don't have deemed originating, but they have roll up. And roll up means that if something meets the content rules for its part category, it is then considered 100% conforming for all other purposes of the rules. This change to these um, more broad. Uh, categories of parts that are covered modernizes the agreement tremendously. The tracing list had things on it like eight track tape players and distributor caps and things that aren't in cars anymore. Um, this new uh, rule is much more broad. And as Jack pointed out, you know, there's some very novel um, requirements here. The aluminum and steel sourcing, the labor value requirements are brand new and we've not seen those in any other trade agreement. Um, and it also addresses some non, some things outside the trade agreement. So there were provisions that in through side letters that Canada and Mexico would um, have some exemption to any 232 tariffs and some limited protection if we were to raise our MFN tariffs uh, to on autos and parts for the rest of the world. So there were, you know, this trade agreement was addressing things outside of the trade agreement itself.
Um, these are the content thresholds that they have to get to over the course of three years. I think, you know, last week um, we started to see there was a communication from the U.S. Trade Representative to the House Ways and Means Committee uh, on their progress in implementing we're aiming for this July 1st implementation date. And as uh, Jack pointed out, the USTR believes that this will be helpful um, in the COVID-19 crisis as, we tr as it tries to bring more and more um, work back to the US. Um, but they've set up these interagency committees, both on labor and environment, um, the labor attaches that they're going to um, have in Mexico. Um, the USTR has added staff uh, that are focused on the labor enforcement rules. Um, and then they've added a forced labor task force to the Department of Homeland Security. Um, the Department of Labor is preparing uh, the LVC or the Labor Value Content Interim Regulations. Um, they're also working on dispute resolution um, and the environment, um, environmental requirements. And then alternative staging. Uh, Jack kind of jumped over this a little bit, but there is a provision where um, automakers can apply for an additional two years to comply with these rules but they have to provide tremendous amount of detail to the USTR about their credible plan to meet the rules over five years. And my big concern with that is, you know, lots of things can change in the course of five years. So I study labor agreements and many times the automakers will make a commitment that we're going to make this investment at this plant and it's gonna mean this many jobs. And those investments, you know, that were made in the two, the commitments that were made in the 2007 agreement did not materialize because 2008 and 2009 intervened. Um, sometimes they make commitments like in 20, 2011, 2015, and they exceed those commitments. But the course of investment and the, and the ability to um, comply with these rules over the course of five years and, and stick to this alternative staging plan um, is going to be very dynamic um, depending on the underlying economic conditions. Um, they did add some new steel and aluminum rules um, during the last minute negotiations where steel has to be melted and poured in North America. Aluminum, they're investigating this and the big problem there was that Mexico does not have any aluminum smelting. Um, so they were not uh, all on board with having melted and poured as a standard for the aluminum. But overall, the core parts rules, the labor value content rule, incentivize US and Canadian production due to that labor value content rule, the $16 an hour. Um, there are uh, credits toward those um, con the content rules, the 40% for cars and 45% for trucks uh, and um, abilities to average within a country to get to um, that labor value content rule. But I think ultimately um, it could mean more uh, US and Canadian content in vehicles. Now let's look a little bit at the post COVID-19 automotive industry. Um, I really see that there's three options and the three options are uh, reshoring. Do, you know, do we bring things back uh, from the rest of the world to the United States? And um, that's one. And that's, I think the hopeful thing that the USTR is thinking about that um, USMCA implementation will help bring things back. The other is diversification, many eggs in many baskets. Do you want to have all of your production dependent on a region that could have a tsunami, a flood, a fire, a epidemic um, or a disease outbreak? Um, or do you wanna have many eggs in many baskets? And then the third thing that could happen here is status quo, not a lot of change because they've already got a fairly resilient supply chain um, that is global um, and diversified. And so maybe they think they can manage uh, with what the footprint looks like right now and with very little change. Um, and how will manufacturing change? We mentioned um, in Jack's presentation, increased automation. You know, automakers and suppliers and especially lower down the supply chain have been talking about the difficulty in getting workers already uh, to work in their plants. Um, and so, you know, an increase in automation in the factory is a long-term trend that may accelerate as we bring more manufacturing back. And as Jack mentioned, it um, sort of negates the low-cost country advantage um, if you're going to automate processes more broadly. It also, um, automation does not get sick, um, can work within three feet of each other. Um, you know, they have many different requirements that might make it more possible to continue production in a post-COVID world. And then there's something I'm calling plump lean. 
um, we've worked very um, hard at implementing uh, the lessons from the Toyota production system throughout the auto industry. And maybe we need to plump some things up a little bit, put a little bit more buffer in, put a little bit more um, in, the, in the supermarkets, in the stores, um, in the supply chain in order to um, protect. So that's the trade-off that Jack mentioned between resiliency and efficiency. And then consolidation. And I think we're going to see this writ large, largely driven by the financial crises that some of the firms are going to face and the need to make these long-term technology bets that cost a lot of money. Um, so you've seen uh, sort of tie-ups between Ford and Volkswagen. You see um, GM and Honda co-investing in cruise automation, um, you know, and electrification and automation and a number of different uh, realms. Um, I think we're going to see more and more of this consolidation of the industry, you know, FCA and PSA tying up uh, to be one of the largest automakers in the world. Um, so those are some of the big changes I think we're going to see in manufacturing. And with that, I'm going to end my fun and uh, give my son a text that I can answer the door for him in 10 minutes. <laughs> okay. And let me take my screen share off. Yeah, take your screen share off. Okay, there we go. Very good, thank you. Um, we have Alan for a little bit. He's gonna, he has to take off for a, a, a meeting. Uh, but uh, let's start with a, a question that, that has to do with the uh, labor value content. Um, it's going to require a full transparency. How successful will the industry be in exposing their full value per part? Uh, and will the industry be able to measure the complexity of an LVC? I think it's going to be very challenging. Um, and I don't know that it, it essentially requires transparency. So right now, the only, lab, the only data that we have on content is the American Automobile Labeling Act, um, administered by NHTSA under Part 583. Um, and that is really, really meat acts. Um, and it's pretty interesting because like the vehicle I drive, a Chevy Equinox has one line, even though you, know, you can get an engine that's made in the US or in Canada or um, a transmission that may have been made in China or the US. And so the content for each particular model would change dramatically, but they list one line. The um, Honda, Corolla, Honda Civic, sorry, um, there are like 12 lines. Is it a two door? Is it a hatchback? Is it four, you know, all the different variations and they give a different content rule for each one. Um, NAFTA has requirements for content that are not public. So the data set is entirely kept with the government. So I don't know that it increases transparency to the public. It may increase transparency to the governments um, that are administering the, the trade agreement. And yeah, they're going to have to um, get a lot more data from suppliers, suppliers that are already really stretched um, in this uh, COVID-19 um, environment. Uh, to build up to their labor value content. Some automakers are going to be able to do it on their own without amassing their supplier data, um, but some are going to have to go to the supply base. And it's going to be extremely challenging and costly uh, to implement this big change in, you know, for a July 1 entry into force. Alan? Yeah, I, I have wondered, uh, especially since a conversation I had with uh, a former student of mine who uh, was for a long time with the AFL-CIO, uh, she's very critical of NAFTA. She did, told me that she just, she can't imagine that this uh, labor wage requirement is ever going to be uh, really effective because it will be too hard to implement. Um, I don't know if she's right, uh, but I, I do wonder, uh, however it is handled by the government, somehow uh, the decision has to get to the border uh, uh, where the uh, decision to levy the tariff at the border is being made or communicated, I guess, uh, to the traders. And uh, I mean, I, I presume that for most things, when you're talking about rules of origin, uh, those who bring about across the products have paperwork uh, that tells about the country of origin. Uh, is that paperwork, if it's handled by the government, who's going to provide that paperwork so that they know whether to levy the tariff or not? Or, or is the government simply going to tell them, 
these companies are okay, let it through, and these other companies are not. I don't know. Uh, it, it just sounds horrendous to me. And so it's, it, I am inclined to suspect that it's never going to happen. Well, I think it's also, um, you know, I'm going to hesitate to say this um, definitively, but it's a, it's for U.S. and Canadian production, it's a fairly low bar. Um, well, yeah. Oh, yeah. Of course. Because there are credits to right. um, to apply toward it. Um, it essentially is a disqualifier for much of Mexican production. And when uh, we were looking at the first implementation of USMCA, it was um, about a third of Mexican production was not going to qualify and they would be disqualified for um, different parts of the rule, but the labor value content rule was a major portion of um, why those that a third of production was not going to qualify. So automakers have choices. They just, you know, some of those vehicles are some of the smaller, um, low cost, low margin vehicles that maybe uh, don't sell so well in the United States. So maybe they just pull them from our market um, and we have less choice. So those 363 nameplates drop down some. Um, and Mexico, um, as we mentioned earlier, has free trade agreements with a great uh, share of the automotive market in the world uh, for 50%. Um, Canada and Mexico can both reach 50% of the market for new vehicles without a tariff. So they just focus to non-NAFTA markets or they trade with China, or I'm sorry, with Canada under uh, CPTPP rules. Yeah. And they can do that because they're both in CPTPP. Um, so there's different outlets for those vehicles that are disqualified from the U.S. market. Plus, the, the tariff on cars is 2.5%. Um, it's pretty low. And, uh, you know, on a small car, that may not work. But on some of the CVs or, or larger vehicles, it could. Um, the only place where I think it's really going to bite is on truck manufacturing, where the tariff is 25%. So may I uh, follow up on that then? Uh, if... if Wait, nobody has talked yet, except you just did now. How much of the trade in North America is just going to go ahead and pay the tariff, in which case none of these rules will matter to them, and they might as well source all they want to from China or wherever else. I mean, how much is already happening uh, that's paying the tariff? Do we know? Yeah, well, if it's non-binding, right, that, that's saying yeah. that the agreement's non-binding. And you know, I've made this argument before, and I think you know, over the long term, that's not a sustainable strategy. But in the short term, in the midst of the COVID-19 crisis, it very well may be a short-term strategy to get through. Um, and, you know, one of the areas where it's particularly impactful is on electric and electrified vehicles. Those tend to have some of the lowest North American content in them, according to Labeling Act. And, you know, Canada has these incentives to buy more electric vehicles, um, but most of them, all but one model, <laughs> is made in the United States or Japan or someplace else. They only make one electric vehicle in Canada themselves. Um, but if they have very, very low content, like 35% or so, uh, are you going to bring that up to 75% for a small market in Canada at a 6%, 6.1% tariff? Um, or are you going to just you know, sell fewer in Canada? Then we sell virtually no electrified vehicles in Mexico. Um, built here in the U.S., sold here in the U.S. There's no customs border between uh, the leaf plant in Tennessee and California where they sell them. Um, I don't know what's going to happen to the content of electrified vehicles built in the U.S. for the U.S. market. Very good. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, I'm going to go let my kid in. If you, <laughs> I got one question for you before you go okay. uh, and let your, let your I, child. I'll, I'll be back on, but I've got to go. In. <laughs> okay. Uh, ha has to do with the, um, how much time it will take for the U.S. to get back up to full speed after the pandemic. Oh, I wish I knew. Yeah. <laughs> I wish yeah. I knew. I mean, I think, you know, we're looking at a restart of one shift and a handful of plants um, across the U.S. and Canada and Mexico. Um, you know, that's, uh, you don't make money unless you're at 80% capacity utilization or higher. I think we're going to start at 20 or 25% yeah. capacity utilization to, to start off with. And it really depends on that synchronization of the supply chain and the demand um, yeah. and how yeah. strong that comes together. Very good. All right. Thank you very much. All right. I'm going to be off for just a second and I'll be back. Okay. Uh, our next speaker, uh, Joe Zazek from the uh, original, assist, uh, original Equipment uh, Supplier Association. He's the uh, uh, Research and Industry Analysis Manager.
His responsibilities include tracking and analyzing diverse industry and exogenous data sources to create content that supports members' needs. Before joining OESA, Joe was an economics research analyst at Ford Motor Company, specializing in analyzing global uh, economic developments to determine implications for the auto industry. Joe graduated with honors from the U of M Dearborn with a Bachelor in Arts uh, a degree in economics and minors in finance and political science. Joe, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Bruce. Uh, you can share your screen and take it away. Uh, sure. All right, can, uh, can you see that? Well, I'm seeing your presentation. I'm seeing two oh, slides. Hang on one second. Okay. <clears throat> There you go. Oh, that, okay, great. All right, so uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, so my name is Joe Zaychek. I work for the Original Equipment Suppliers Association. We're a trade organization that represents the automotive supply base. Um, we're a sister division of the Motor Equipment Manufacturing Association, uh, which is our, our parent organization, which has uh, you know lobbying efforts in, in Washington, D.C. Um, front, and uh, they also do a bit of influencing from on the on a regulatory standpoint as well. So I have a pretty interesting job. Um, you know, I, I look at a lot of the data sources that my fellow presenters do. Um, you know, monitoring government data, looking at trade data, and and so on. But um, I have a really interesting position in the in that. Um, one of the major benefits of, of having a, a large member base such as ours is that I'm able to survey our members and really quantify uh, some of the anecdotes that we've you know been hearing in the news. And that, that really gives us our, gives our members a, a really great opportunity for um, benchmarking against uh, peer standards, as well as uh, providing some quantifiable data that we can uh, support our efforts in Washington. Um, skip that slide. So uh, j just uh, just to touch on the COVID uh, pandemic. So as I as I mentioned before, I'm I'm able to you know develop a real time data set for um, for our members. And what we've really seen since the uh, the pandemic spread to the United States is just this overwhelming shutdown of of uh, supplier facilities. So uh, in the weeks heading up. In the weeks heading into April 20th, uh, we, we saw 64% of our members' uh, US facilities being completely shut down and a 25% rate that indicated that they'd slowed production significantly. And really this is just in response to the, to the OEMs um, announcing their plant, sh plant shutdowns. And it's really critical for the OEMs to get back up and running. Now, this data, these data were collected before uh, the latest announcement that um, that Alan shared earlier that um, <clears throat> uh, the OEMs were going to delay until mid March. And really, the timeline before that was the beginning of the beginning of May. I'm sorry, I misspoke. The middle of May is now the new time timeline uh, plan uh, for the OEM restart. And this is really critical for, for the supply base because as uh, Kristen met, mentioned before, she the suppliers aren't receiving any revenue um, if they're not pr production. So their, pr their number one priority at the moment is to plan accordingly um, and, and get their plants back up and running. So we asked specifically what, what the biggest challenges were for suppliers as they, they were uh, planning for restart. And the number one and two responses were just, were the accuracy of startup times and then the accuracy of uh, their customer release volumes. And 
overwhelmingly these st these stood out as the top top concerns but but ironically enough enough it was the extension of the shelter in place mandate in michigan that postponed the oem restart into the middle of may as opposed to the beginning of may um which i think that that was a little bit un underrepresented as upper under represented upper re represented uh, by the results seen here. Um, and then the number four uh, concern is just is the available availability of uh, personal protection equipment. Um, you, we all know that, um, you know, upon research, everyone wants to maintain their, their workplace safety. So there's going to be an overwhelming demand uh, for personal protection equipment. And so, so the supply of uh, those pieces of equipment are a uh, top concern as these uh, plants come back underway. <clears throat> so just an example, uh, just an example of that. Uh, you know, we've we've done a lot of work on on you know planning for a, a safe restart um, strategies that our members are going to are pursue with um, with returning to to a normal work environment, and overwhelmingly, uh, there our members say that. They're going to uh, be providing masks for um, for their for all of their employees. Now there was a zero percent response rate saying that no masks were going to be provided for their employees, um, with a smaller uh, subset just being a little bit in indecisive at, at the moment. And um, so, and then we can see like the further breakdown of the type of masks that they're pr providing, which which would be uh, a surgical mask more than anything. <clears throat> so, uh, it kind of in combination with these, with these, with the ad hoc research that I do, um, you know, really my focus has been lately, uh, you know, strictly on on the COVID uh, pandemic and uh, how to how to deal with it and how to plan for restart. But my major product is our uh, OESA supplier barometer, and what this is is a, it's it's a uh, quarterly analysis of both supplier sentiment, uh, threats to the industry, and then we do a deep dive uh, every quarter um, to investigate you know long term uh, fundamental drivers of the industries, uh, and so this is a, these are the results from um, the first quarter of 2020. And we had a really big rebound in uh, in optimism. So we went from a uh, a index score of of uh, 37 in the fourth quarter of 2019 to a score of 47, and that's just under the neutral neutral territory of 50. And that was really um, driven by the passage of USMCA. Uh, our member base is really or really diverse. We have, you know, anywhere from a, a small mom and pop tooling company uh, <clears throat> that is, you know, pretty limited in, in exposure to, uh, to to global changes, and you know, they saw that the passage of USMCA is a really big benefit for the, for their businesses, um, and and it took one of the uncertainties off the table. So, like I said, uh, every every quarter we ask what the what the biggest threats to the automotive industry are, um, and for eight straight quarters, uh, changes in government trade policy were was running at number one, and then the passage of USMCA dropped it down to number two, just behind poor sales of uh, vehicles and programs supplied. Uh, this is a this is a, a big big change. Uh, I mean, the, uh, the threat of changes in, uh, in, in global trade policy was at was the top concern for uh, my entire career at OESA. And um, having it having it subside a little bit was some, was some good news. However, uh, last year in the second quarter, uh, we dove a little bit deeper into what specifically the uh, threats to changes in trade policy were. And the overwhelming uh, response to this question was the proposed Section 232 tariffs on autos and auto parts, um, and then fo followed uh, closely by uh, tariffs in, on steel and aluminum. Um, now, 
you can see changes in USMCA policy. I mean, this was this, this these data were captured way ahead of any um, passage of of the uh, policy or or the um, really the the finer details of, of the policy itself, and that was nearly neutral um, as indicated by our members. Um, so the the uh, proposal of um, Section 232 tariffs on on other auto auto parts is really the uh, the, the biggest concern that um, our members are facing heading into um, a, you know a norm, more normal environment. <clears throat> so if we uh, if we look at our North American uh, production dynamics, you can see a really uh, there was, in 2019 there was a a really um, expansive uh, increase in uh, the number or the, the, the percentage of products that were produced in Mexico that that jumped about 13% with uh, from 2018. And that and that was really taken out of um, out of the US. And the focus of that over the next or the, the, the change in that over the next five years is is not expected to, uh, to decline at all. Uh, Mexico is really well positioned, as Chris, Kristen mentioned, uh, with the amount of FTAs that they have um, as an exporter for the rest of the world. Um, and at, but at the same time, there there is uh, some some expectation that um, that that parts manufacturing will will increase in the in the U.S. And I think that that has is largely to do to um, you know the changes in the USMCA. Um, that we have on, on the near horizon. <clears throat> so, as, so as far as the localization efforts, uh, last last year we saw a, a bit of decline uh, in comparison to 2018 uh, from from the OEs and the tier ones to the rest of their uh, supply chain, as that was over communicated in 2018. And now we're really seeing um, an effort from tier ones and sub tier suppliers pushing to localize down uh, their, their supply chain. <clears throat> so when we look at uh, the where, where parts are, are going, um, so this is this is a, uh, a snapshot of um, US produced automotive parts and where they're sent. So in 2019, the median uh, percentage of domestically produced um, products that were exported to anywhere else in the world was only 10%. So what that says is that these parts are being used internally. So they're supporting, uh, you know, OEM facilities and other and tier one facilities within the United States uh, that ultimately, um, you know, find their way into vehicles and. Uh, that are produced, you know, in here in the Midwest, down in Texas, um, and then along the East Coast. Uh, but it's pretty pretty interesting to show that there isn't really uh, there is a there is a substantial de decrease in the amount of um, U.S. parts that were sent uh, into Mexico. Primarily, uh, the reason being is <clears throat> is that, like I said before. Um, you know the parts are ultimately used here for to support production, and um, if if parts are being uh, if vehicles are being manufactured in Mexico, then they're going to capitalize on that regional structure uh, to support the the Mexican OEM facilities. <clears throat> Sorry, <clears throat> so. Um, Directionally, where we're heading is, um, you know, the, the regional plan for U.S. exports is, is to support the, the Mexico facilities as there's continued investment from OEs in, um, if, with manufacturing facilities there. Um, uh, to a small degree, uh, sending finished parts to China and Europe as uh, those are the uh, expected areas for the development of electrified vehicles. And then um, the rest of Asia being used as a um, as a hub to support um, China Chinese production. Now on the on the import side, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, 
so only only 30 percent of the dollar value of the content of uh, U.S. produced auto parts is imported from anywhere else in the world. And there's a pretty even matching between ch uh, China and Mexico. But those those numbers are down pretty substantially from from the uh, the prior year, uh, with the median responses being 23 uh, percent and 20 percent, uh, respectively. <clears throat> Now, uh, like, like I mentioned, um, you know, as, as suppliers are starting to, uh, you know, invest in, in the rest of Asia to support, um, you know, the production of vehicles within China, they're also able to capitalize on, on, uh, on those, uh, on supply or on doing business with those suppliers and also build, building facilities there uh, to support um, production here in the U.S. Um, and then Mexico, obviously, um, you know, that's, we're continue, we're going to continue to, you know, accelerate um, our reliance on the, on their cheap labor as, you know, they're really um, closely related. We have, you know, a highway system that we're connected directly to. There's the, and, and it really supports a, a timely, just in time uh, type of industry. So one of uh, one of our focuses is, is you know to determine like like I said earlier the the biggest risks to the industry, and uh, overwhelmingly uh, the the number one responses are uh, all timing related. So re receiving late changes for uh, customer uh, customer engineering changes, um, short shipment short shipment silly and this this really reiterates the the fact that um having this regional focus um for your supply chain is is critical for efficiency and um any type of disruptions with within that air within that space is that really costs suppliers and um you know it, it deteriorates the relationships that they have with their with their customers at the same time Uh, so, had, so when we look at uh, the risks of pr production, you, you can see, you know, in a slightly different view, uh, you know, what are your greatest internal risks meeting uh, customer production re requirements, and that's short lead times, and then also labor and production issues. Uh, from, a, from a supply chain aspect, it's, it, timing is, is critical. You know, these, the, the automotive supply chain is an incredibly dynamic um, industry, and it operates with incredible speed. So, in order to deliver parts at um, you know if efficient time and an incredibly massive volume, uh, being as quick and responsible as possible is uh, is business critical. Now, it's it's really interesting. Um, how everything changed so rapidly within uh, the auto industry. I mean, it, it seems like three months ago, I couldn't go to an external presentation um, anywhere that wasn't 100% allocated towards uh, electrification. Um, the OEMs have, are, are, have done, you know, incredible job of, of strengthening their commitment to producing you know, really a, just an incredible change to the industry uh, where we're going to stop relying on um, the internal combustion engine and, you know, start relying on a, a, a much cleaner um, energy source. And the, our, the supply base is really, um, you know, has, they're already ben benefiting from that. So, um, you know, doing new business with companies like Rivian and Tesla are they're really driving in innovation, um, you know, from the suppliers. Um, but at the same time, the suppliers are really concerned about volumes. So you can see here uh, the the number two um, most responded to uh, answer for this question was the, you know the lack of program profit profitability. Now uh, you know the Tesla has been you know pretty successful with you know. Eat, squeaking out, you know, one quarter of profit profitability, but 
the the name of the game in the auto industry is volume and in order to um really capitalize on that um it's it's just going to be incredibly difficult in in the near term with um with with the small amounts of volumes that we expect domestically but not only that but you know uh around the world at the same time so when we ask suppliers you know what are their expectations for electrification um no one was really optimistic that it was going to happen you know anytime soon so how confident are, are you that global bev production will reach a substantial portion within uh the next two years and overwhelmingly no one's very confident in that um <clears throat> It, within the the next two to five years is a little bit better, um, but really the you know we didn't break above the new, the level of neutrality until five to ten years out, and that's really interesting considering uh, the the amount of money that um, OEMs as well as suppliers have been investing into this. It, it's just an incredibly long payoff period. And the, this COVID crisis, you know, it just, it, it couldn't have come at a worse time. Um, you know, we're, we're really, we're, you know, heading towards a, a big trans, a technological transition within the automotive industry. And this, this issue is, is just going to push everything out, you know, it, in my opinion, you know, years into the future. <clears throat> From a from a re regional perspective, um, no one expected that uh, Bev production was going to happen. You know, um, be led by North America um, with a weighted a average forecast of uh, of eight point nine years um, in order to reach ten percent of total total production. I mean, at seventeen million units of of sales, that's I mean, that's one point seven million units. I mean, you know, you, you can only divide that by so many models in order to have everyone, you know, making a profit at that point. And then, uh, you know, Europe and China have had some, you know, regulatory pushes that are, you know, really going to drive that innovation uh, locally there. Um, but I would, ex I would expect to, to the, uh, you know, the, pri my prior, uh, the prior presenter's point was that, you know, the regionalization within those industry or within those, uh, you know, epicenters of automotive sales, that uh, it would, the, the investment from the supply base is going to happen to the outlying countries. So in Europe, um, in being supported by Middle East and Africa, uh, the underdeveloped countries like Turkey and the uh, um, former Soviet states, and then China really, um, you know, be, being supported by the ASEAN countries, um, Thailand, so on, so on and so forth. And then, uh, you know, just to simplify everything, there's a, 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 a you know, we just asked, you know, where uh, do you believe, you know, 10% level of total production and electrification will first occur? And uh, over, overwhelmingly, the, the response was China. Um, a small subset in North America, and then um, probably a reflection of some of our uh, European members that it was it was going to first occur in Europe. So with that, I uh, I'll I'll open it up for Q and A. Oh, Bruce, you're still muted. Kristen is unmuted as well. Okay, everybody is now unmuted. Um, thanks for very much for your presentation, Joe. You really gave us some nice insight into uh, what your supplier groups are thinking. Um, when you think about what you're what you're seeing from your supply base, uh, what do you think is going to be the major uh, changes that are, you see happening probably over the next two to three years in in supply chains. Uh, in regards to trade or technological development, it could be. Uh, let's talk talk about uh, probably either like supply chain management 
uh, sourcing decisions uh, uh, within uh, within your supply base. Right. Uh, well, you know the ch the the changes in in USMCA really threw a uh, you know a curveball at the suppliers. Um, you know, Kristen mentioned the challenges that they that they face as, as far as um, you know accounting for the labor value content, which makes you know the issue even more incredibly complex. Um, but at the same time, I think that there's a really big opportunity for the, your core core components producers to provide value to the OEs by have, producing modules and big ticket items domestically um, that allow their vehicles to be, you know, qualify for uh, reference uh, lack of lack of tariffs on anything and and have and and not have to pay any type of uh, a tax on production, so to speak. Kristen, do you have anything you want to add on that? Well, I think, you know, you can go back to the hearings for the 232 tariffs um, at, you know, there, there was nobody in the industry who was uh, really supportive of 232 other than perhaps the UAW. Um, the UAW's testimony at that hear hearing uh, like two years ago in July um, talked about the uh, parts of the supply chain that have not yet fully matured, um, things that are related to electrification, automation, um, you know, the sensors and cameras and all of that stuff where we're not um, broadly just deploying those across uh, the current manufacturing base. Um, but that, you know, it wasn't a move to bring back air filters and oil filters. It was, you know, how can we capture more of the high value right. content that's going on to the modernized um, vehicle? And, you know, that we don't have a LIDAR puck manufacturing at scale. So what right. are the incentives that we need to do to make that happen here? Um, I think even if it, wherever it happens, it's going to be more automated than, than it otherwise would have been. Um, so, you know, we're bringing back some jobs, but there, there's, uh, there's a limit to that. Yeah. Uh, Joel, uh, Joe, do you expect more dual sourcing uh, coming because of the pandemic or, and or the uh, trade agreements? Um. You know, I, I it, it, you know, within the supply community, I mean, we're really at the at the mercy of of the OEMs. I mean, it, you know, that's an interesting um, aspect. I mean, it, our 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 members have you know really emphasized the point that as long as the OEs are are committed to um, returning to production um, in a timely ma manner, that they'll have no issue, you know, getting up, getting back up and running and, you know, providing the appropriate uh, volume um, to support, to uh, support uh, that vehicle production. Um, but as, you know, as Kristen pointed out, uh, you know, with the, the, uh, the, the fire on the West side of the state, I mean, you know, that's Ford's uh, golden ticket, so to speak, the F-150, I mean, that's their breadwinner. And, you know, having a single source item like that, that can completely shut down your line um, is, you know, this, it just opens up another opportunity for risk. Um, and I would, I would anticipate, you know, you know, po possibly an increase in, in dual sourcing, but, you know, as, as everyone else has pointed out, you know, the entire world is experiencing the, the COVID uh, pandemic. So I doubt that, you know, the pandemic itself would really um, accelerate that type of strategy. Well, yeah, I think, you know, the other interesting part about the fire in West Michigan at the magnesium casting plant um, was that there just isn't that much magnesium casting capacity in, mm. the, in the world. As we've moved to lightweighting, you know, there's been this like catching up of the supply chain's ability to do these, um, you know, hot stamping and uh, casting of magnesium and other metals that we're using that you know we used to be primarily steel so lots of steel casting not a lot of magnesium casting so the the workaround for that was to charter the largest plane in the world get those dyes that were not damaged luckily on a plane to England where there was some magnesium casting capacity and ship parts back from England for a short period of time until they could rebuild in West Michigan so that's not cheap 
No. Um, and but you know, and they certainly may have dual sourced that part if there was capacity in North America. Otherwise, um, all of the magnesium casting capacity in North America was full um, yeah. when they went to look for where they could source those parts in the short term. I I, th I think it's those kinds of examples that really uh, bring home the complexity of the industry and, and also the resilience of the industry. And, and how much money they are willing to spend to make, to make things happen when they need to make them, make them happen. Uh, Kristen, I have a question for you. Uh, do you know, have any sense of, of what percentage of parts are uh, dual sourced by the manufacturers? I don't know. I have no idea. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's and then a there's dual one. sourcing and even I, within... I sure there's even dual sourcing within one one supplier too. A supplier may have, like I said, you know, three or four different locations around the world, and there's been some of that uh, to get around um, the China tariffs. Is that you know we were sourcing this from China for U.S. production, and now we're going to reroute our you know Taiwan production to China, and 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 uh, you know so just moving things around within uh, larger suppliers that are, that do have a global footprint, just shifting which factory serving which market. Right, right. And I think the, uh, 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 we've seen it uh, in the past, in particular with the, the Japanese uh, suppliers, they go, yes, we dual source. We have a plant in the U.S. and we have a plant in Japan. <laughs> that that's becomes their, their form of, of, uh, uh, of dual sourcing. Um, I guess I, I want to end it uh, today uh, with uh, one question for both of you, um, and it, it's, a, it's a, a pandemic question. How do you see the pandemic changing the industry uh, that we know today, if at all? I think, I think um, I covered you know, the immediate of my presentation, yeah. Uh, Go ahead, Jeff. Joe, yeah, I, I, would, I, would, I would, I would really echo, you know, what Kristen said about, um, you know, expecting some co consolidation. I mean, there's a lot of cash rich firms that are out there right now, and there's going to be a lot of, a, a lot of smaller mm -hmm. firms and all, you, even some big ones, you know, they're really going to run into some, some solvency issues and it's, it's going to, uh, you know, really, um, open up some opportunities for, for M and A and uh, consolidation. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Uh, Kristen, you said you were, you said some yeah. things in your presentation about this. Right. And I think, you know, I, to echo um, Joe, you know, the consolidation is not only based on um, the solvency or insolvency of the, of the companies, but the big technology bets that they have to make. So we may see things short of, M&A, but more partnerships, more joint ventures, more activity where they're leveraging each other's ability to put the cash out on these longer term uh, technology bets that, you know, are immense. Um, I think greater automation, um, fatter lean, and, and consolidation are my three trends coming out of post-COVID. And, and one yeah, more that I just remembered good. is probably continuing to manufacture medical PPE for a little while because they're gonna need it for production, not just to support um, exactly. the medical industry, but we need, yeah. we need the PPE in the plants. I know it'll Absolutely. be intense. It's gonna be intense with uh, thousands of thousands and thousands of workers, uh, you know, especially if they're only one use, if things are only one, you use them one time, then you're starting talking about Every day you're you're swapping it out. It's a tremendous amount of, of effort uh, and and product uh, from the PPE. Or side. several several times a shift. Very even. good. It's, Thank you. It could be several times a shift. It's very yeah. hot yeah. there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very good. Yeah, locally. Well, you know, thank you very much, the, uh, Joe, the hospital. Joe and, and and Kristen. I want to thank yep. you both thank for you. participating. Um, great presentations. Also want to thank our audience for sticking with us uh, and also our, our uh, affiliates for uh, supporting the conferences and um, and we'll see everyone hopefully again uh, in July for our uh, 
Powertrain Strategies for the 21st Century uh, Conference. Uh, I think we're going to be looking at some of the issues related to the uh, tipping points for electric vehicles. So please feel free to join us. Uh, thanks again, Kristen and Joe, and uh, we'll talk to you later. Take care. Thanks, everyone. All right, bye-bye.